Now that we have Wi-Fi access, we can all patients in agri-food systems and understanding the drivers of the financial flows in the sector. In gathering a diverse set of stakeholders and partners, we aim to ensure an in inclusive process of co-creation of solutions with multiple voices and perspectives from a range of global constituencies. Audience in the room, please note that the event will be live streamed for colleagues across CGIAR. And we have invited a few members of the media, uh, the local media here today, so please be aware that there may be journalists in the room. Um, I would like to invite now uh, Dr. Marco Ferroni, Chair of the CGR System Board, on stage for his welcome and framing remarks. Marco, please. No, it doesn't seem to work. Thank you so much. Lotte, they're clapping for you, not for me. Too much gear here on a small space. Good morning. Thank you, Lotte, for the introduction and welcome, excellencies and distinguished guests, friends, and colleagues to this timely and important discussion organized in partnership with The Economist, which, of course, we read religiously once a week. The Economist will develop from today's session and related dialogues a report on financial flows to the agri food sector. I know there are experts on this very question right here in the room. In a curtain raiser published yesterday, they posed the economist a simple question. When it comes to ending hunger by 2030, are we investing in the context of the recent and rapid deterioration of uh, in global food security? I find these facts alarming. Over the past two years, the world has reached a pressure point few would have imagined when CGIR was founded today. And I'm going to make a few comments on this, fully aware that all of you who are from CGIR know these facts better than I, but I'm speaking to the economist. Today, we are facing a catalog of complex and interconnected challenges, pandemic, climate change, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, soil and water resources, degradation and civil strife and also armed conflict. And at the same time, we are seeing rising inequality, gender inequity, and a deterioration of health due to inadequate nutrition. In combination, these short and long-term factors have thrown the world off track. Years of gains against hunger and poverty are being reversed as we look. At least 800 million people are going hungry every day. Climate change could put an additional 183 million people at risk of hunger by 2050. And half the global population, half the global population will very likely experience water stress by 2030. That's only seven years from now, if current demand and use patterns continue. The impact of extreme weather and unsustainable practices and lifestyles on our food, land, and water systems is evident everywhere, and scientists' most insistent warnings, including warnings from CGIAR scientists, have rapidly become a lived reality for many. Resilience offers humanity hope for a more secure future, and that is that more secure future is what we are working on and what we are debating today in terms of what we need to do and how to behave. The vital question in this context becomes, how do we close the gap between what is being invested today and what needs to be invested in order to end hunger? This is not an academic question. It is a matter of life and death for a growing number of people worldwide, and certainly here in Africa. At least in part, the answer is, I think, within the gift of many of us gathered in this room, working as we do on the mission that unites us to transform food, land, and water systems to deliver a food and nutrition secure future for all sustainably, empowering smallholder farmers across the global south, and in particular in Africa, with the research and innovations that they need to thrive. As an organization, we, CGIR, naturally need to evolve and to adapt to remain relevant and attract funding to work towards this common goal. The demands of systems transformation through partnership-based inclusive innovation for healthy, equitable, resilient, and sustainable outcomes must frame our response. Partnership and co-creation, co-ownership, and genuine respect for different worldviews are fundamental conditions of success. Three quick announcements in this respect. This morning, 
We will hear an update on the work of the high-level advisory panel that the CGIR system board convened to guide leadership on strengthening engagement with partners. CGIR is creating a new mechanism to support capacity sharing and strengthening of national research and extension systems, and I am delighted to report, ladies and gentlemen, we are aligned on the causes of the crisis that we face, that we face today, on the impact it is having around the world, and on the urgent need for us to respond. We share a common mission to deliver food, land, and water systems transformation in a climate crisis, supporting smallholder farmers across Africa and across the global south. My hope is that our dialogue today builds on this commitment and identifies real actions to boost investment and put us back on track to achieving SDG 2, because SDG 2, SDG 2 is off track as, as I speak. Three spotlight conversations, so-called, this morning will frame key challenges and opportunities of climate adaptation, nutrition, and, as mentioned, partner engagement through the new action plan under the Abidjan 2 agreement. I'm delighted, again, to have the economists guiding our discussion today and bringing your voice to this very, very important dialogue. I'm going to say it's an existential dialogue for humankind's future. I would now like to invite the Honorable Agriculture Secretary, Mr. Josfat Gatirumuhunyu, to present to us his keynote remarks. Please join me up here, Mr. Secretary. And let me introduce you, Mr. Secretary. I know that you have worked in extension services and capacity building for farmers for more than 30 years. You're currently Agriculture Sec Secretary of the State Department for Crop Development and Agriculture Research at the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries and Cooperative. And you're a global citizen. And I heard, and this is uh, this flummoxed me because you have a full-time job, that you are at the same time currently pursuing a PhD in Agriculture and Resource Management at Egerton University here in, uh, in Nairobi. Mr. Secretary, you have the floor, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, sir, for the elaborate uh, introduction. I'm highly humbled. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jambo. Good, that is our Kenyan fashion. And uh, I'm delighted that I could get a lot of response from you. Uh, I'm happy I've been well introduced. And uh, regards from my uh, cabinet secretary and the principal secretaries who are out of the country, they are in Rome, again, attending a similar agenda. So they really wanted to join us here but it was not possible because uh, of other issues. So you are highly welcome and uh, feel free and we are happy that you chose Kenya to host this event. May I uh, most sincerely recognize the presence of the representatives of the CGIR centers and uh, the senior management team also the partners in the agricultural sector, uh, government officers who could be present, uh, other invited participants and commitment towards the development of the agriculture uh, in the world and specifically now that we are hosting you in Kenya. Your participation in this event demonstrates the importance of agricultural research and innovations in the socio-economic development of our country and the other benefiting countries. I'm optimistic that the commitment of CGAR centers and all partners to support agricultural transformation will contribute to our vision of a food, secure, and prosperous world. This is in line with, uh, especially for Kenya, uh, we are happy because the agenda of the day that is uh, the scaling innovations in the agri-food agri sector in the global south resonates very well with what our country is going through. 
It is important to note that Kenya is also actively participating in the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub, or what we call the hub, in the five regional dialogues uh, focusing again on the preparation of uh, the food systems stock taking movement, the STM, in 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, agriculture is a very important sector in the global south. In Kenya, the sector contributes on average 26% of the country's GDP and a further 27% through forward and backward linkages. and about 40% of the overall population. That is how important it is. In spite of the importance of the agriculture sector, the sector suffers from a number of challenges which include climate variabilities, uh, low levels of mechanization, large fragmentation into small and economic units, and little or no value addition, and of late, the effects of COVID-19. This has escalated uh, uh, the commodity prices and disruptions. In, of course, disruptions in the global supply chains have also had their own impacts. However, the challenges provide opportunities for increased investment in the sector. To address these challenges, the government of Kenya has put in place interventions to support agricultural research, commercialization of GMO crops, provision of input subsidies, and digitization of extension services, among others. Kenya, like the rest of the world, is experiencing a rising demand for food from a fast-growing uh, population. Currently, an estimated 4.5 million Kenyans are suffering from food insecurity, owing to drought and other related food security challenges. To ensure food and nutrition security for the Kenyan population, the government is implementing measures aimed at increasing agricultural production and productivity, uh, food availability and access, and also reducing the cost of food in a sustainable manner. The country's development agenda is spelled out in the Kenya Vision, which was very important for us, and also other speeches that our uh, Excellency the President has been giving. To produce the desired results, the government has laid out a sound recovery and transformation plan geared towards achieving our national commitments as well as our regional and global obligations in agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, to transform Kenya's agricultural sector and to make it a regional powerhouse, the government is implementing the agricultural sector transformation and growth strategy and this takes cognizance of the fact that agricultural growth and transformation depends on collaborative efforts and stakeholder contribution. The strategy prioritizes three anchors, and uh, the first anchor is increasing the small-scale farmer, pastoralist, and fisher folk incomes. The second one is increasing agricultural output and value addition and expand uh, the agricultural D D GDP contribution, and also increasing household food resilience and reduce the number of food insecure Kenyans, especially in our arid and semi-arid regions, which form ab about 83% of our land mass in Kenya. This is quite massive, and uh, a lot has to be done. Again, other than the development of the ASTGS, the government has put in place initiatives to ensure that we achieve 100% food and nutrition security over the next created a favorable legal and policy environment to support private sector investments, especially in post-harvest handling, market infrastructure, agricultural processing and value addition in order to create employment and investment opportunities for Kenyans. Again, climate change has really evolved from being an environmental problem to a major development challenge impacting all economic sectors. To address this challenge, the Ministry of Agriculture has developed initiatives to mitigate the impacts of climate change, build the resilience of Kenyan people against shocks and emergencies, 
conduct research to inform crop suitability and development of technology to monitor land use changes and impacts. The ministry is further implementing the Kenya Agricultural Insurance and Risk Management Program, whose objective is to build resilience and promote investments in agriculture sector for sustainable food and nutrition security. As envisaged under the Kenya National Agri-Nutrition Strategy, the government is addressing uh, nutrition issues through development and rollout of flour blending. You realize that we take a lot of maize flour. That is maize is our, uh, our staple of food. So the blending part is now taking a clear initiative. And also uh, supporting production of nutrition dense foods and diversification production to ensure resilience to climate change, reduce resource conflicts, which consists of several organizations that evolved, have evolved since early 1990s uh, to the current National Agricultural Research System, a solid and sustainable platform for development of scientific capacity and culture in extended National Agricultural Research System is instrumental in ensuring a continuous flow of knowledge and frontier technology of the best appropriate quality. Research in Kenya has, however, faced, uh, however faces challenges, uh, including lack of coordination, underdevelopment, and segmented research systems, and is highly underfunded. The sector is working to strengthen research in and innovation and launch priority digital and data use cases for better decision making and performance management. Ladies and gentlemen, on innovations, the agriculture sector is harnessing the power of data, digital applications, and use of mobile technologies in the development of e-extension, that is extension services, provision of agro-weather, and marketing information. We are having platforms like Kayap and Kamis. Uh, pest and disease surveillance, we are having e locust and plant clinics. Uh, investing in uh, sustainable irrigation practices, particularly in the uh, semi arid and uh, arid and semi arid regions, and early warning systems by developing latest technologies, including aerial solutions and geop spatial rotation and commercialization of human food and animal feed produced uh, through biotechnology innovations. This decision effectively authorizes uh, open cultivation and importation of GMO crops, including white uh, geo maize, uh, which the ministry emb uh, embraces as a progressive step towards uh, redefining agriculture in Kenya. There's a lot of a debate on this, but uh, we are optimistic things will go the right way. The cabinet decision to allow the GMOs is based on considered scientific data and knowledge. And uh, to realize the desired benefits from this technology, there is need to enhance research, surveillance, awareness, and capacity building on these uh, GMO technologies across all the stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my hope that through this continuous engagement with the partners in the agriculture sector, the government will develop a well-transformed and vibrant agricultural sector which will contribute to the national economy and ensure food and nutrition security for all. As I conclude, I urge all of you to continue the noble duty of developing and upscaling innovations in agriculture as we work towards supporting agricultural transformation for socioeconomic development. I wish you a productive and rewarding event. God bless you, and thanks a lot. Secretary, thank Kenya has long been an innovator in agriculture, in value addition, and in new and innovative value chains, the creation of value chains for the domestic market and for export. I know, uh, Mr. Agriculture Secretary, you have been a planner, motivator, and driver of this process. And we also know, and you have alluded to this, of course, 
that enormous problems remain that call for transformations from farm to fork that you have characterized uh, and on which the Kenyan government and society are working under your leadership. Mr. Agriculture Secretary, CGIR is grateful for the productive, stimulating, and frankly, enjoyable uh, partnership that we have with Kenya, with CALRO, with the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries, and Cooperatives. It took me a long time to get to livestock, Jimmy. And more broadly, the agriculture sector, the farming community, the livestock keepers, and the herders. In this sense, thank you very much for being here with us and contributing your thoughts as we begin our deliberations of the day. Of the day. Thank you so much. Okay. And now, uh, it, it, it's difficult, isn't it, Agriculture Secret Secretary, we have to hold our own microphones because I think this one, this one, the installed one, doesn't seem to work. So we're both getting used to it, right? Now, the high-level panel, what's it called? The high-level panel? The high-level advisory panel on engagement and partners. Three o'clock this morning, and uh, he has probably had as little sleep as I have had. Um, so Namanga will provide updates from the high-level advisory panel that, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, was convened to give guidance on how CGIR should strengthen and could strengthen its strategic engagement with countries and regional partners as we finalize the transition to one CGIR. The word finalize is not exactly correct. That is what my notes are saying. As we build the next step in the generation of steps towards one, <laughs> one CGIR. Now, Namanga, of course, is, uh, no, does not need any um, introduction. Among his many credentials, Dr. Ngongi was the founding president of AGRA and has been chair of the board of trustees of IITA and a member of the CGIR system management board. The advisory panel that he co-convenes with Dr. Umalele brought together highly qualified independent representatives uh, with deep and diverse experience and knowledge in agricultural science and innovation in the global south. And the panel's full findings based on surveys and uh, regional and country consultations will be presented to the system board later this week for an initial review, uh, I think, on Friday. On behalf of the system board, I would like to convey my gratitude to Namanga and uh, Umalele for the, and the full membership of the panel, of course, for the time that they have given and the contributions they have made. And with this, please give us a summary of what you have learned. The board and members will work together on the SMB. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here in this uh, Economist Forum, Africa Forum, talking about uh, financial flows to the agri-food systems. At least, uh, <clears throat> it's also a great honor to be introduced by Marco, who has informed us that he's uh, uh, going to take some rest from the System Management Board after many years, some five years or so. And welcome to my sister, Lindiwe, who will be taking on that mantle. I am here to present an update on the work of the high-level advisory panel that was set up by the CGIR System Management Board. So that's my role. So let me get to my own function. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, the CGIR System Management Board appointed an independent external high-level advisory panel to guide leadership and staff in strengthening their strategic engagement with the countries and regional partners in the CGIR uh, as the CGIR continues its transition to an integrated, let me say, to a highly coordinated and integrated one CGIR. I think those two words should go together, actually, really. The purpose of the HLAP and its work it was to advise on fostering ownership of reforms and mechanisms for joint learning and engagement with governments, regional organizations, effect across the global south. What are the activities of the HLAP? Five key activities. First, asking. asking. The stakeholder survey was launched. We received more than 250 responses from a wide 
range of stakeholders. Listening. More than 30 in-depth interviews were undertaken with key stakeholders. Understanding the context, several key documents were reviewed. Discussing the high-level panel engaged in seven in-depth discussions, and the eighth was held yesterday while I was in the plane. But that was mostly to look at the 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 draft, uh, the preliminary recommendations to be discussed on Friday with the uh, System Management Board. And presenting, at the end of our work, of course, we'll be presenting recommendations to the System Management Board and complementary actions to propose to the CGIR System Board. Second, next slide, please. What is emerging from the HLAP process? Vast changes in the global architecture since CGIR was formed requires a different mindset and model as CGIR goes through its transformation. Noting that the declining share of CGIR has been mentioned in budgets and China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, for example, that are becoming increasingly important players. The increasing role of the private sector a huge change in the agricultural innovation and food systems agenda with new issues in which CGIR does not always have more capacity than others, than other part players. The previous North, South and donor grantee dichotomies becoming less relevant for many issues on the agenda and the response to these changes in global architecture are not simply an operational issue, but have strategic implications which need to be recognized and responded to accordingly in one CGIR. Next slide. Please. What is, em what is emerging from the HLAP process? Some key messages. Partnerships cannot be isolated from the rest of CGIR's business and how it is being transformed. Engagement must be at the center and properly integrated across the system. Partners need to be engaged from the onset and throughout the process to ensure co-creation, co-ownership towards delivery and impact. The new engagement framework is a step in the right direction and needs to be fully integrated and open stakeholders about the objectives. Do I read two slides at a time? <laughs> okay. <laughs> about the objectives, functionality, and processes of the CGIR transformation, including its intentions and direction for improved partnerships. Finally, key stakeholders such as GFAR and regional fora and also others offer potentially important engagement partnerships and opportunities to, the, to support CGIR to engage with various partners by serving as valuable partnership platforms and the CGIR should take advantage of them. Without uh, prejudice on the outcome of all of those recommendations. I'm sure, having participated in this reform process from many years now, that if the recommendations are adopted and acted upon with a new mindset by all the players, it will create an environment favorable for increased financial flows to the agri-food systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Namanga. Would you mind remaining here because we'll take a question or two? But I just want to say, in, uh, this is my summary, uh, high-level summary, that there cannot be pursuit of impact. There cannot be innovation without partnership. There can be research to create knowledge and new idea, ideas, and boy, do we need knowledge and new ideas. But we are ultimately, since we are an applied organization, judged by the impact that we have probably floating on the tables. Would anybody like to intervene? 
don't tell me that there is no question because of the well, of course you were convincing, but uh, that there are so many wrinkles to partnership. Wrinkles is maybe not the right word, but there are lots of, I mean, partnership requires deep engagement. Re partnership re requires a willingness to think along the terms of your partner. And that's not necessarily given to everybody. Let me just say, I use the word, join the two words, coordinated and integrated. Because integrated can be big research programs which you do need an integration of thinking across these uh, centers, uh, disciplines. Uh, for the research programs, I think the word is actually correct. For delivery and impact at country level, it is more coordinated action rather than integrated action. It's difficult to go country to country and integrate all the actions that need to be, uh, but it is possible to coordinate them. So that's why I put those uh, the two words together. Okay, I think with this, since I'm not seeing any demand from the floor as much as I can see, I think, Namanga, thank you so much. This was wonderful. It was, um, every time I get to work with you is a, is a treat. Thank you. thank you so much. And I turn it back to Lotte. Thank you, Marco. Um, okay, so picking up on the theme of, uh, so to lead this session, I'm going to invite Tamina Lalani Sharif, our Regional Director for South Asia, and our moderator for the next session up to this stage. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and Jumbo. Um, and thank you to our um, friends for the help with removing that lectern. So we've got a little bit more of an open space to have a conversation this morning. Um, this morning, we're going to have, um, welcome to the Spotlight Conversations. We're gonna have three conversations over the next 50 minutes. Yes, we are gonna make it possible. Um, and we're gonna look at emerging technologies and also what these technologies, um, what we need to get these technologies to smallholder farmers. So they focus on climate adaptation and mitigation, and specifically on the management of re water resources, um, which my friends at IMI have schooled me in the fact that it often gets left out when we talk about climate adaptation and agriculture. We're also gonna talk about nutrition and health um, innovations. And then finally, we're gonna get a chance to bring it back home locally and talk about Africa's agriculture research and innovation institutions. Um, so I'd really like to maximize the time that we've got this morning, so I'm going to um, suspend with introductions necessarily. Um, I'm going to invite our speakers and panelists up onto the, uh, onto the dais, and then we can jump right into the conversation. So with us today is Dr. Aditi Mukherjee. Um, Aditi, would you like to come on lead for World Fish and CGIR? Um, she's joining us, Shakuntala is joining us from, Toronto, from Tokyo. Uh, and then we have Dr. Noman Degler Bias, I'm sorry, <laughs> Bias Galanbat. I practiced it so hard. Good morning. <laughs> um, our Senior Technical Specialist for Social Inclusion and Nutrition at the South African Regional Office of IFAD. Welcome. Um, we have uh, Dr. Yemi Akinbamijo, for the, the Executive Director for the Forum for Agriculture Research in Africa, FARA, who is also joining us remotely. Good morning, Yemi. And then finally, we have Dr. Harold Roy McCauley, our CGIR Managing Director for Regions and Partnerships and Director General of Africa Rice. Welcome, everybody. So uh, let's jump into our first conversation with Aditi and Roberto. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, and maybe I'll direct my first question to, uh, to Aditi. So agriculture, as you know, we hear regularly, is both a source of emissions and highly vulnerable climate impacts. Um, can you speak a little bit to why that's the case? Um, and then also the consequences for some of our most vulnerable groups. So here specifically, we're speaking about small, um, smallholder farmers. 
Um, I think uh, the reason that agriculture is most vulnerable to climate change impact is, is, is kind of pretty simple. It's also the most exposed to climate in the sense there is hardly any other occupation that makes people depend as much on you know when the rains will happen or when the rains will not happen so basically at the heart of it is agriculture that includes also pastoral livelihoods fisher folks it is just completely dependent on climate more or less so that's why it makes so um, i mean um, um, agriculture is just so exposed and um, and that really makes them so vulnerable Okay, especially as they become more unpredictable, right? Okay. Um, so, Dr. Lenton, Roberto, we were speaking earlier this morning about water management and, and the ability to do better water management. Um, so, we know that it plays a water management plays a major role in climate change and adaptation for climate change. Um, so, if better water management is part of the solution, what approaches do we need to think about to take that on? How do we do better water management? Well, thanks very much, uh, Damien, and thanks for inviting me to, to this, and it's a pleasure to share the podium with, with Aditi. Um, I guess the, the starting point really is the, the latest IPCC report in the water chapter, and, and Aditi was the lead coordinating author on that, um, which predicts, and we're seeing it, um, increased rainfall, <coughs> um, <coughs> increased droughts, increased floods, uh, more rainfall variability, um, glacier m uh, melting, uh, 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 rising sea levels. Um, and, <coughs> and we're seeing cer certainly this year with floods in Pakistan and, uh, and droughts in the Horn of Africa. Um, and all of that reinforces the fact that so much of the uh, impacts of climate change will be experienced uh, through changes in the water regime. And if that's the case, then the best way to adapt to the those changes is by better water management, by managing those water resources in ways that allow the impacts to be, to be min minimized. Um, and that requires approaches that really um, deal with the impacts, more resilient forms of managing water uh, for the future. Okay. If we were able to uh, actually bring these technologies to the hands of most, the most vulnerable groups, um, and how could that help them to uh, deal with climate change? And I'll, I'll direct that actually both to, to both of you, whoever would like to respond. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Tamina. That's a, that's a great question. And I think um, there are a lot of uh, technological innovations out there, and farmers have started using it. I can see, um, you know, in the water field, a lot of the innovations around uh, how do you know when exactly to irrigate? Like, you know, use of soil moisture sensors for irrigation. Then uh, you have technologies such as um, how, do you, uh, how do you make entire irrigation less carbon intensive? I already said that agriculture is also a source of emission, and irrigation is one of them. So how do you make um, irrigation carbon free? And that's where technologies like solar irrigation pumps, for instance, comes out. Um, so I think, uh, I think there are technologies out there, then there are also policies around how do you provide those social safety nets, how do you provide those proper insurance products. Uh, but what I want to underline here is that technologies often are not enough. What it needs to be done is those technologies have to be underpinned by proper policies and institutions. I think very often uh, these technologies are out of reach for, say, smallholder farmers. So I think for us the main question to ask is how do we make those technologies both affordable as well as accessible to smallholder farmers? and that's where the challenge lies, um, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, great. Roberto, would you like to add anything? Um, Aditi has said very much of what I would say. Um, <coughs> the only thing I would add is that when you're thinking about... <coughs> about, about how do we actually implement this, um, so if we were to think about um, actually making these technologies more accessible to vulnerable groups, can you speak a little bit about how maybe each of your organizations are doing that? And, and I'd also like to understand a little bit better, Aditi, you spoke about the need for policies and institutions. I'd love for either of you to comment also on the role of the private sector in bringing these, making these technologies more accessible. Um, <clears throat> well, let me just um, talk a little bit uh, about that range of questions. I, I guess one starting point would be to say that you don't want a model where you have technologies um, 
being de uh, developed by research institutions um, and then the policy process um, and implementation being separate, I think research really has to encompass uh, from uh, not only the development of technologies but how they can be applied and implemented in the policies that are required. Um, and in that context, um, I would point to the work of IMI um, in the last many, several years um, in uh, doing the research and the evidence base uh, <coughs> on technologies that work, but in addition, uh, engaging with countries um, to be able to both uh, assist in uh, the reality is and what our IPCC assessment overall showed is when it comes to adaptation in reality there is actually very little private sector involvement. Uh, in mitigation is different. Mitigation is often like you know in the field of renewable energy you get a lot of private sector involvement. So for us the challenge is how do we make adaptation something that private sector feels that it's you know it's profit, profitable and worthy investing there. So I think that's a challenge. The other thing um, that I worry about quite a lot is a lot of the things and the adaptation particularly that we work on now are going to become increasingly ineffective in a warmer world. And we are headed towards a warmer world, right? I mean, we are headed towards a 1.5 degree in, in less than a decade. So, so how fast can we as research organizations but also the private sector can keep up uh, to make sure that our adaptation remains effective in a warmer world? And evidence shows that they are not. So I think there's a key role for both private sector as well as for science organization. How do we keep up with those? I mean, how, how do our seats perform at two degree plus warming level? I think those are the questions that for us and the private sector. Okay, yeah. fantastic. That's a great one for us to think further about. Um, just as we close off, uh, Roberto, I'd love to ask you one last question. Um, so alongside the investment in research, um, to research, develop, and roll out these technologies that we've been talking a little bit about, what are some of the um, other policies and practices that need to be in place to incentivize and support uh, investment in R&D for water management? So in addition to some of the policies we've already touched on, are there others that you'd like to, to talk about or mention? In, in water, um, the, uh, one of the examples that I always use um, in terms of policies that really help um, small farmers um, in this context is the work that Aditi did for which you got the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the award, the Borlaug Award, is research that um, was looking at policies, not in the water sector, but in the energy sector, that might make it possible for small farmers that didn't have the means to be able to buy pumps to, ac to access water, policies that would enable um, the larger farmers to actually have incentives to share that water um, and to sell water to those who weren't able to do it. Um, and there's an excellent example of policy research which was then worked with government to help implement those policies. Thank you. That's a fantastic uh, example for us to close this spotlight conversation on, so thank you to both of you. Um, we're now going to move on to the next spotlight conversation which, in which we're going to talk about nutrition and health innovations. Um, and so uh, I, uh, we're going to be joined by, uh, by Shakuntala and Nomin, who uh, I've got a couple of questions for both of you. Um, so sh perhaps I'll start with Shakuntala. Um, welcome. And what I'd like to know is, so you know, we heard earlier today that if trends continue, then the number of undernourished people that will be in the world will surpass 840 million by 2030. Um, which is horrifying in and of itself. But could you talk about some of the practical and sort of ready-to-scale interventions that may be able to help us reverse this trend? Could you talk about that briefly and give us some food? No, we still can't hear you. Oh, there we go. There we go. We've got you. Okay. Thank you, Timena. As you mentioned, the trend in undernourishment is really dire. And now it's further exacerbated by climate change, by conflicts, and as we've seen in the last few years by COVID-19. We have been making very good progress up to 2015, and it is possible for us to do so again. So I think we must be optimistic. To do so, if we look at every food statistics, we must embed nutrition-sensitive approaches. 
And let me give some examples. We have introduced nutrition-sensitive, context-specific agri-food systems in Bangladesh, in Cambodia, and in Zambia. For example, homestead pond polyculture and production of nutrient-rich vegetables or podikes. And we've also introduced fish, rice, vegetable systems in wetlands. And these nutrition-sensitive agri-food systems can be adapted and scaled across Africa to address the challenges of hunger and malnutrition. So yes, we have examples, and we can go to scale. OK, fantastic. That's a that's a very hopeful note to, to finish that first question on. Um, Nomin, I'd, I'd like some of the considerations that we need to keep in mind as we work to scale up biofortified crops a little bit further. Um, and, and speak to us about that, please. Thank you so much for having me and the fact that this very important um, venue. Um, biofortification. Uh, IFAD's investment um, and commitment is to make um, more than 60, at least 60 percent of its operation uh, nutrition sensitive. And um, embedding nutrition along the all operations of IFAD. And particularly we noticed that uh, from experience from the COVID-19 response uh, is uh, biofortification can be cost effective and can be also a sustainable solution to combat micronutrient deficiencies. And how it's done, um, some of the effort operations to respond to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, or it's, they have provided a support to smallholder farmers with the inputs, with the crops and seeds that are biofortified. So it's, it's helping them uh, not only to increase the yield and to have a better, um, let's say, outcome of the food security, but also uh, having a better Im uh, impact on nutrition. And uh, so these operations uh, seem uh, working better and well, and smallholder farmers are not only um, adapting and using this um, biofortified seed, but also, um, there was a one of the innovation of IFAD was is not only supply these seeds and equip them with the knowledge how to grow in a different con conditions, but also to educate them how to consume. But in another thing is sustainability. So what we have done is the smallholder farmers uh, used what is called pass on approach. So they are passing on. Uh, these seeds to other communities, to other members of the communities. I hope this is uh, provide you provided uh, answers to your question. Absolutely, no. I think it's uh, you've you've raised two really important pieces. One around the the behavior change communications and really creating that opportunity for ad adoption. And then I love the notion of the sustainability. That's uh, we have to be able to build build that next step in the path. Right. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'd like to come back to Shakuntala, and um, we talked earlier with uh, Aditi and Roberto about the need for policies and the intervention, you know, to work closely with governments around policy development and evidence-based policy. So if we think about that in the context of nutrition and health, um, and we think about the role of government, can you tell me about some of the top priorities for public policies and programs to improve nutrition outcomes? Let me So as we all know, policymakers and governments, they're entrusted by their people to develop the policies.
Fantastic, thank you. Those are great examples. Um, so last question so we can close off this spotlight, um, qu spotlight session. Um, I'd love to ask Noman, from your perspective um, working with IFAD, can you tell us a little bit more about how can we catalyze evidence-based investments in nutrition outcomes? Um, you had some great points when we met earlier and I'd love to hear you reflect that for the audience. Uh, yes, uh, so um, I mentioned that IFAD's investment and commitment is to increase and make sure that all investments are nutrition sensitive. So it provides an opportunity uh, for collaboration and partnership. And I would like to emphasize the partnership is become a key for IFAD because obviously IFAD is not going to um, support and stand and um, implement alone and therefore, uh, we see that um, particularly partnership with CGIR system is a critical. The reason is that uh, CGIR can offer the science-based, the evidence-based solutions, which the different uh, financial institution uh, can uh, take this and put into its investment. And for that, I think a stronger and more uh, systematic way of collaborating with the different uh, CGI institutes is to embed the research and innovation in its operation, in its investment. Another th aspect is uh, for us, for IFAD, it's very important that um, collaboration with the private sector. And indeed, uh, IFAD is reforming itself to put private sector in a way that it's a systematic partner. So it's not about only the CGI or science-based research institute. It's about also collaboration with the private sector, which they can bring vast knowledge, experience, technologies, investment as well. And the third is about collaboration among different financial institutes, because it's important that important and therefore, um, I think we should collaborate and partner and scale up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you to both of you for this, uh, our, our second spotlight conversation. Um, we've all had a chance to be uh, en enjoying the Nairobi weather the last few days, I think. Uh, and for those of you that just flew in this morning, hopefully you'll get a chance to enjoy it today. Um, but now I'd like to kind of bring our conversation home, uh, not just to Nairobi and to East Africa, but to look at the continent of Africa. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, Yemi and Harold to speak with us a little bit about uh, the research and innovation institutions here in Africa. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm actually going to put this question to both of you. Um, uh, so tell me about, uh, we're, we're just, uh, we're going to go into a session later this afternoon about the Abidjan II agreement. Um, and it's a really significant development. Uh, it's been a long time coming, lots of hard work. Um, tell me about what does it hope to achieve from each of your perspectives? I don't know whether Yemi would like to come in first. Why don't you go ahead? I can't see him on the screen yet. So why don't you start, Harold, and we'll hope Yemi will join us. OK, thanks very much, um, Tamia. Um, <clears throat> but I guess we all agree here that um, the research um, that has been um, carried out by the CGRA over the past 50 years has delivered innovations which have created a lot of impact on the livelihoods of populations all over the world, globally, especially Africa. But at the same time, what we're seeing now is that um, when we look at the figures, we're projecting $100 billion um, food import 
by 2030. Um, there is a real problem here. And I believe that we have to think and reflect um, on transformative actions and investments that will help develop or strengthen the food systems in order to respond to the objectives that we ourselves have set in Africa. Um, I think this is very important. So when we look at the discussions that's going on um, between the CGIR and the African research and innovation institutions, it's quite clear that they have recognized the fact that the CGIR has been um, very responsive to all of those challenges. It has developed um, a 2030 research and innovation ag agenda, um, all talking about climate change and all the various um, difficult um, challenges that we face. Very complex, very int intricate. And um, these research and innovation institutions in Africa have recognized that, that it's, it's a very powerful instrument. They have also questioned the fact that they want to be involved in the process, the ongoing reform that is going on, for several reasons, because they believe that the CGR is capable of moving with them to solve these problems. So this, this agreement is all about that, and um, it aims to actually focus on some of these issues. There are big strategies out there, but this one is particular in the sense that it's going to focus on some of the low-hanging fruits, which I call them low-hanging fruits, um, in terms of partnerships, appropriate partnerships, in terms of scaling out innovations that are out there, numerous innovations that are out there, and um, also... Um, Specifically about the signatories to the Abidjan 2 agreement, um, and how will they work together to actually bolster these um, agriculture research and innovation systems across, across the continent? Okay, well, maybe, um, maybe Harold, would you like to speak? Well, you've spoken a little bit about the signatories. Is there more that you want to add to that? Otherwise, I've got another question about South-South cooperation that I'd love to ask you about. Well, yeah, I already spoke about that, but it's important. I think it's, it's, a, it's one of the, the I, I believe it's one of the differences that we're making. Um, like I said, we have all the strategies, um, yeah. the Malabo strategy, the CADEP strategy. We have all of them. We have the CGIR strategy. But I think it's more than that um, for now. And um, if we're having all of these um, key stakeholders, not only research and innovation institutions, but we have the banks, the development banks that we've been working with for years. We have the African Union Commission that we're working with. We've been working with them for years. But we're now saying and committing ourselves to something very great. I think that makes a big difference. And um, it's quite exciting. That's and fantastic. we'll talk more about that this afternoon. Excellent, excellent. Um, so one of the questions I had when we were sort of looking at the Abidjan 2 agreements, and, and maybe we'll close with this question, is that, you know, like you said, we've had, um, you know, we've, we've talked about the, the role of this agreement within the continent of Africa, but do you think that there is a, a role for South-South collaboration beyond the continent? How is that, is there a possibility, what are the opportunities for that to enter into this agreement and have an impact, a, po a positive impact on this agreement? Sure enough, um, Tamina, um, we've been talking about South-South um, cooperation, but I, I guess at times I see we tend to talk about, you know, we tend to say words, we add words one, two, three together, and we try to, to put a, a sense around it. But I believe that South-South cooperation is very powerful. Um, it is a manifestation of the, the, the well, the, the, the ability of countries and, and, and people to, to, to work together. But it's more than that, it's founded on two things, I believe. Um, strong political dialogue, which we don't often get, and also strong financial cooperation. So I believe that those are the key elements of South-South cooperation. And when we look at the big developmental challenges that we have, it's quite obvious that those two elements will go play a great role in helping us to achieve objectives. And I, I believe that you know, South, South cooperation is, is just there. It has to be integrated into the way we do things. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and like you said, we'll have a chance to talk about more of that on that topic this afternoon. 
Um, so I know that we're coming up to time. Um, just as a closing, I'd like to invite any of our panelists here. Do any of you have a question for each other or a comment that you'd like to close with? Support and believer of, of partnerships, and I think um, um, Nangonga has said a lot about it. Um, how do you think um, we could, um, and, and we've done a lot of work on, on, on climate change in Africa, but I think we need to do more in terms of the partnerships. Do you have any idea of what mechanisms we could put in place to actually achieve that? Um, I think we've been talking about this, but if you can just provide an answer. Yes. And you have make, asked make me a hard question. Um, I'll, I'll try my best. I think um, this time during my involvement with the IPCC, uh, the Africa chapter was for the first time in the history of IPCC completely led by scientists who are based in Africa. And I think that's, that's kind of is a testament of the growing scientific capacity within the continent to deliver that kind of science. And that particular chapter had something that particularly resonated with me, and that was for every $100 that comes to Africa, less than, I think, $2 actually stays in terms of it. I mean, in terms of research dollars and all of it. So I think the challenge here is that there is no lack of dearth of knowledge or expertise within the continent, but how do we, uh, how do we through partnerships get those kind of fundings that actually you know, benefits the continent where the science is being generated and the impacts are being generated. To me, uh, that to me from a, yeah, uh, I, I thought are uh, important questions to ask. Fantastic. I think we're at time, and with that, I'm going to thank all of our panelists. You've uh, certainly sparked our conversation and sparked some good ideas. Um, and I want to thank our audience for, for listening and so intently. Thank you. I'll now pass it on to Lottie. So our consultative roundtable is going to be moderated today by Mr. Sadir, Sadar Karim. Sadar is a researcher at Economist Impact with special expertise in policy analysis, economics, and management consultancy. So I'm going to hand over to Sadar, who's going to introduce our panel for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everybody. So um, before I call upon this stage all our panelists, um, I just want to talk a bit briefly about um, the kind of research that we are doing at The Economist and also our ongoing research that we are doing in collaboration with CGIR as we speak. Um, so um, thank you a lot for that introduction. Food Security Index, I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of it um, and that you have seen it. It's in its 11th year now, uh, and, and some of the findings and the data from that research is really worrying. Um, so after hitting its peak in 2019, the global food security scores have since declined. Um, and there are political, economic, and environmental developments in 2020, 2022 that have put extreme pressure on global food security. Food prices, as you all very well know, are volatile, and prices of critical agricultural inputs like fertilizers and fuel remain high. Globally, the average spending on agricultural research and development has been continuously declining, as we heard this morning from Marco as well, and that's what our research has also found. Um, and then the COVID-19 pandemic and the escalating climate crisis forced 150 million more people into hunger in 2021 than there had been in 2019. Given further socioeconomic and political disruptions um, to global food supplies in 2022, the WHO now projects that nearly 670 million people will still face hunger in 2030. Um, and obviously you all are aware of the zero hunger targets that, that um, UN has set for 2030. Um, now, obviously, restoring progress towards ending hunger will require, out of which $14 billion would have to be provided by international donors, which reflects a doubling of the existing donor contributions, a big ask, really. Our preliminary analysis that we are currently doing um, with CGIAR, we have analyzed data on 10 
low and middle income countries. And that, uh, that preliminary research lends support to the role of increased funding for agri-food in reducing the prevalence of undernourishment significantly through gains in agricultural productivity. However, link between funding and agriculture productivity seems to have weakened since 2017. Um, despite a sharp uptick in funding since 2017, prevalence of undernourishment has steadily risen, at least in those 10 countries that we have analyzed so far. And there could be various reasons behind it. Um, one could be that gains in productivity do not necessarily benefit the most vulnerable to hunger. And also, we also know that there's a third of food being produced is also wasted. So agricultural productivity into production doesn't necessarily reflect in, in um, lower uh, prevalence of undernourishment. Um, another factor that, that our Global Food Security Index um, for this year has revealed is that there is also an increase in divergence of food security between the top and the bottom countries, um, which in a sense saying there's another inequality that you, we should be aware of in addition to all the other inequalities that we already know about. Um, so, so what we are doing now is that we are conducting a research on behalf of CGIAR to change will influence demand for finance in the coming years. We have our prelim preliminary findings on our Economist website on the Economist perspectives, so you can, you can go and have a look at it. But the, the, major, the, the big research will be coming out sometime next year, so stay tuned for it, and you can have access to it um, on, on, our, on our portal um, next year, early spring. Now, coming to today's discussion, um, what I just said in terms of food security and obviously malnutrition and what we have heard this morning, um, that's obviously alarming for all of us. So what does this all mean for food security? For around 10 billion people by 2050. Are some populations being left behind? What can governments, international community, the private sector, and the scientific community do today to innovate and scale agri-food solutions that benefit all? To discuss these questions and more, we have a distinguished panel of guests with us today, and I'm extremely honored to be the moderator for this. Um, I would like to call upon stage all our panelists. Um, Dr. Claudia Serov, um, who is the Executive Managing Director of CGIAR. Dr. Johan Swinnen, who is the Director General of International Food Policy Research Institute and also Managing Director of Systems Transformation at CGIAR. Dr. Kanayo, uh, who is the Chairman of the Board of Directors and Chief, Chief Executive of FAYODE, a Nigerian not-for-profit organization working for youth improvement. Dr. Nompomelelo Oboko, who is the CEO of South African Council for Natural Scientific Procurement. And, and with that, um, if I may request someone to remove the podium, please. Thank you. I just want to check, um, Dr. Ramesh, can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, all, the, all the guests. Uh, I, I welcome you all once again. Um, so our discussion will be roughly in three areas. First, we do want to talk about the, the agri-food innovations. We heard some of that earlier this morning as well, but we want to broaden the scope and talk about um, the entire spectrum of food, food systems, agri-food systems. So that would be our first topic. The second topic will be about financing those innovations. And the last one will be about scaling those innovations. So first, I do want to open up with um, a really yes or no question to our guests. Um, and, and as we all very well know that this year, COP27 would just concluded, and there was a food and agriculture pavilion there, um, which obviously is a, a, a right step in the right direction. But the question for our guests is, do you think the world has reached an inflection point to realize that our agri-food systems need a fundamental transformation where agriculture sits at the heart of the climate change agenda? If we just start with Claudia yourself, it's really a yes, no question. 
Thank you so much, Sardar. I think I can give you a yes, no-ish answer. I think yes, we've reached a point where the understanding is there. The UN Food Systems Summit was quite eloquent about the need for a food system transformation. And for the first time at a COP, a cover letter decision spoke specifically to food systems. But I think it's a no when it comes to acting on that under Actual increase again of malnutrition and that combined with COVID-19 now with the food price spikes I mean it's really it's a it's a perfect storm and I hope we use it for the right for the right way um, thank you um, I tend to I, I would like to disagree with my colleagues I, we probably are at an inflection point, but I don't believe we accept that we are not uh, because this has happened before. It happened in 2008. We talked about food crisis, uh, food price crisis. And I don't think that we as humanity have come to a realization of what lies ahead of us. Otherwise, We'll not, be, we'll not be here talking and trying to justify uh, the importance of research or the importance of agriculture. So I don't think we have actually gotten there yet. And a lot more is going to happen that will force us on our knees. The future is not bright. Thank you, Dr. Kanayo. Uh, Dr. Oboko? Thank you so much. I think from our side, as we look at the impact of climate change, really, uh, for the small-scale farmers, it is quite uh, staggering and negotiating. So we do need to take uh, and uh, action and really think about the future generations. So it is in our hands and in our lifetime to make that change. Thank you, Dr. Oboko. Dr. Ramesh, if you can also um, uh, give us your opinion, please. Uh, if I understand you correctly, your question is in relation to a centrality of agriculture in relation to climate change. My answer for that is yes, and yes. And the reason for saying double yes is that the contribution of agriculture to a greenhouse gas emission is disproportionate to its if you look at top agriculture contributions to the emission, in most of the country and global average is that it is more than what is share of agriculture in this is the first reason. The second reason is that agriculture is one sector which is different than other in terms of its relationship with climate change because it is both affecting climate change and also getting affected by climate change. So we have to worry about both effect on agriculture and effect of agriculture on Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, and, and thank you, everyone. Um, I just like how the question was yes and no, but then, you know, this always happens. So the, the, really, the role of research and innovation is both as our guide, but also as our toolkit. So we do research, for example, in foresighting to help us look ahead to see what is happening, what we expect to happen, what population, markets, diets, um, climate looks like, and what it means for our food systems. We use research like scenario analysis to try to peek around corners, to try to help give us alternatives to what the straightforward business as usual future might look like so that we can think about the options that we have. We can look at alternatives and we can weigh unintended, we can see unintended consequences or weigh trade-offs that we need to know. So that research in terms of guiding us is extremely important. But in addition, we have through research and innovation the toolkits that we need to help us make choices about how we want to transform our food systems. So we can sort of bend the arc of where we're going toward 
greater nutrition, more sustainable practices, more equitable uh, food systems, et cetera. And it's all that range of research and innovation that allows us, for example, to breed more nutritious, productive, resilient crop varieties. It's the research and innovation in agronomic practices that allows us to look at more earth-friendly, nature-positive, sustainable, low-resource use food systems. And it's looking at research and innovation in policies to make sure that we're incentivizing the things policies are extremely important as well. So research and innovation is really absolutely essential if we want to effectively and intentionally transform our food system. Thank you, Dr. Claudia. And uh, this morning we heard like 50 years of CGIR and, and the research that has gone into it. And, and maybe perhaps you can give us some examples um, from, from this entire timeline and, and some of the, uh, perhaps at some key moments in history where you, you think an innovation was a breakthrough. That, that CGIR brought in and, and you know, uh, helped the, the world? Well, l let me give an example of each of the sort of, the sort of three spaces that I mentioned. CGIR, perhaps what we're best known for is our crop variety breeding. And we've really been, I think, at the forefront of breeding more productive um, and uh, increasingly resilient crops. But we also are, have been at the forefront of breeding more nutritious crops. So, for example, we have uh, prov provided more nutritious crop varieties to about 50 million smallholder families across 41 families. We breed in a higher levels of vitamin A, which help not only with our sight, but particularly with small children in their full de brain development, allowing them to grow into their greatest potential as human beings. We breed in zinc, we breed in iron. So in that space, we've continuously been able to change, uh, not quickly enough, getting onto the farmer's fields, but we've continuously been able to change the sorts of crops that our small holders can grow. We've also been uh, quite at the forefront of changing 3%, much kinder to the environment. And we've also been at the forefront of some really interesting policy changes as well. Here's one you probably haven't heard yet. In Sri Lanka, uh, the government uh, approved the use of septic waste following important safety uh, and science research by IMI, um, and that allowed septic waste that is usually simply dispersed unsafely across the environment and into our water bodies to be used to safely create fertilizer pellets, fuel briquettes, and other really useful resources. So we work really continuously across all of these spaces, and we hope help to transform us into the directions of the sort of sustainable food systems that we'd love to see. Thank you, uh, Dr. Claudia. It's, it's really great to hear all those um, amazing innovations. Uh, let, me, let me go to Dr. Kanayo and, and really talk about the impact of some of these innovations which have happened in the past, um, particularly because y you are someone who's been trying to you know, bring in or ensuring that agriculture is sort of central part of international um, development agenda. So can you tell us what these innovations that Dr. Claudia mentioned, or maybe others that you are uh, aware of, what do these innovations mean in the lives of those smallholder farmers, um, the, the 50 million that Dr. Claudia spoke about, um, and other rural poor people, particularly um, women and, and children? Thank you very much. Um, I could talk about this for the rest of the day. <laughs> Uh, well, let me see if I can be as concise as possible in addressing uh, the question that you have just asked how the so-called advanced countries of the world transformed themselves. It was based on agriculture, agricultural surpluses. You know, whether you're looking at England in the 18th century or whether you're looking at uh, Japan in the 19th century or most recently China, Brazil, Vietnam, they were agricultural countries. We talked about the agrarian revolution. But what was behind it was agriculture transformation. And I think for Africa, when we know that agriculture accounts for about 30% or more of the GDP, uh, and 40% of Africa's exports 
value and also 60% of employment. I mean, you cannot ignore the role that agriculture can have in bringing about a transformation. But when we talk about innovation and innovation, as Claudia just mentioned, it's not just new varieties of crops. It's a lot more than that. It's how people farm the crop, how they manage the environment. Uh, and innovation is not necessarily something new. It could be very simple, seeing things from a different perspective. Taking an existing technology from Vietnam to Zimbabwe and applying it in a different context. It becomes innovative. And so, and, and there's a lot of this that has been going on. I, mean, I can give you uh, tons of examples. And basically, we thought, you know, we could breed cassava resistant, uh, millibug resistant cassavas because we did not understand the biology. But I had a good mentor who said, why don't you try to visit the CIBC at that time, Commonwealth Institute of Biological Control in Trinidad? I said, of course, I want to go to Trinidad. We cut a long story short. Those parasites and predators that I brought into Zaire then became what is known today as uh, Sanginga, is very familiar with this, the cassava millibug eradication program that gave the CGIR, uh, Hans Heron, the World Food Prize. That alternative to using insecticides or breeding cost only, to, well, cost. $20 billion. But, sorry, $20 million, I beg your pardon. But it saved the lives of 20 million farmers. Roughly, $1 saved the life of one person. Just think about that investment. Was that innovative or not? But well, that was science. Take the Sahel, you talked about water, planting peats, simple planting peats that collect water and they can plant trees and regenerate. Cap, a Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola bottle cap of fertilizer in the planting hole transforms the yield of millet and so on. Is that innovative? That's innovation. And that is the CGIR pushing all this forward, saving millions and millions of dollars of investment and millions and millions upon millions of lives. I, mean, I can give you a whole long history about this, but basically, I think we need to think outside the box when we talk about innovation. And not just think it's basically building, I'm sorry, breeding high productive, high productivity crop varieties or animals or fish. It's a lot more, and it's a lot more we can do. And just to conclude on this, it's not just us. You can develop new varieties and great ideas in the lab, but for you to scale up that innovation, that's where the partnership comes in. But that's a different topic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kana. We'll absolutely um, speak about scalability in, in, the, in, the, in the third part of this discussion. Um, so let me just bring in Dr. Oboku then. Um, in the context of Africa, obviously, and like Dr. Kana already spoke about, in your experience and expertise, what, what do you think, what can you tell us about um, these innovation systems and, and how they are an engine for empowerment of smallholder farmers? Now, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I must say that I've been privileged to have worked in various African countries and working as a scientist first and also uh, working closely with the small-scale farmers. As Dr. Kanayo now just indicated that, yes, we can be in the lab, come up with very innovative and pulpy variety. And I must say that today, uh, Nigeria became the first country to actually commercialize uh, the BT cowpea which is Maruka resistant. So it is an insect resistant cowpea variety. So it is through these public private partnerships and also accessing proprietary technologies, which you know, in, 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 a, in a normal, uh, maybe a, a public institution, 
you know, you will not be able to gain that. But through these innovative and strategic collaborations with the uh, private sector, we're able, uh, through the African Agricultural Technology Foundation, to access these technologies. And this is biotechnology, understanding that in Africa, at that particular time, that was 2009, uh, most of the countries did not have the necessary policies and uh, the enabling regulatory systems. So we had to start from scratch and engage with the regulators to ensure that there is an understanding on the benefits of these new technologies so that we can demystify and people can understand you know what are the benefits you know from food security point of view but also you know looking at the environment where these crops are going to be grown so these are some of the initiatives which are started and I'm happy to see that there's quite a lot because what we are saying is that let us give our farmers the choices we are talking about a toolbox meaning that there are various tools, there are various technologies. Our farmers, they just need to access uh, those technologies. So we just need as scientists, as stakeholders in the whole agricultural value chain to ensure that small-scale farmers, are, and most of you will know that for the past 26 years now, we have adopted quite a number of uh, GM crops in maize, uh, soybean, and cotton. And working closely with the farmers, it was, you know, in very, very... Uh, I was happy to see that you know these technologies they indeed help you know especially small scale farmers commercial farmers they adopted these technologies for years but government came up with initiatives to ensure that these uh, small scale farmers can actually access uh, these technologies so through there are quite a number of other initiatives that we are involved in but I thought maybe for this discussion I can just yeah just provide we are involved in but I thought maybe for this discussion I can just yeah, just provide those as examples. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oboko. Let me go to um, Dr. Ramesh in India. Um, uh, Dr. Oboko mentioned about the, the public-private partnerships, and, and, and you are someone who is, um, you know, part of this Niti Aayog in India, in a country which is currently obviously feeding more than a billion people, which obviously will go up. So I just want to understand from your side, what are the, the priorities of the government um, maybe in, in the case of India, but maybe you can generalize it a bit more broadly to the Global South when it comes to innovations and research in, in agri-food systems. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Scott. Uh, in fact, we have now 1.4 billion already. <laughs> uh, um, as far as uh, priorities are concerned, the priorities uh, must be based on uh, current reality. And if you look at the current reality of food, it is totally different than what it was two decades back or 25 years back. Our per capita food production has been rising at more than 2% a year. That is the kind of change which we are uh, experiencing. And similar kind of trend is there in the global south, except African countries and some pockets here and there. The main reason, the primary reason for hunger and uh, undernutrition, malnutrition, I would say 10, 20 years back was inadequate food or food shortage. But today, the primary reason for prevalence of hunger or undernutrition or malnutrition or poor health outcome is not inadequate food. There are other reasons for it. In fact, uh, some time back, uh, if we conducted a study on India, tackling agriculture and uh, nutrition disconnected in India. FAO also in its report acknowledged that in India we still have high prevalence of hunger and undernutrition, despite the fact that India is not a food shortage country, it has become in that uh, kind of circle that I'm exporting. That when there is growth rate in food, there is uh, improvement in uh, uh, nutrition and health uh, outcome. This is the first uh, kind of priority. And second is, as already one of the panelists uh, mentioned, the phase behind the plow. Farmers are not be treated, treated as a factory producing food. Farmer don't live only for food. He or she also has a family. They also have non-food needs. So how to ensure that income of the smallholders is increasing income or absolute level of income of smallholders is 
keeping pace with the freedom of the rest of the society, and there is some kind of decent increase. So this is the second shift when our Prime Minister gave call for doubling farmer income, that major shift. Now we will not uh, emphasize increase in productivity as much as we did in the past. We will now uh, focus more on how to increase uh, income, of, uh, income of farmers. And further to address the issue of nutrition, uh, we focused and invested very heavily on uh, rice and wheat, which are our uh, main uh, staple, then on wheat, uh, maize, and we got a uh, big success there. But now, the crops which uh, were bypassed by this green revolution technology, small millers, legume, which are very important and which have uh, gone out of diet of uh, common people and which have important nutrition implication. So shift, some shift in resources uh, and manpower from here now are uh, trying with the uh, alternative method of farming, uh, including uh, natural farming, agroecological farming and different method of farming with the main intention that uh, how we can reduce cost of production, we can reduce dependence uh, on uh, uh, agrochemical. And if there is time on briefly, last uh, priority which we are attaching is that if the consumer behavior is such that they are not increasing per capita intake of cereal, how we can increase nutrition density of those cereal or staple food. So these are four uh, most important uh, new priorities. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, let me bring in Dr. Yuan at this stage. Um, Dr. Yuan, you, are, you have published extensively um, on agriculture, food policies, international development, political economy, trade, and also global value chains. Where do you think innovations and research need to focus on? Are there any particular areas in this whole agri-food supply chain where innovation and research has higher returns than other areas? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I was actually uh, starting with making up a list of these things, and it's a bit like thanking your your family at the party, right? If you thank five people, the sixth and the seventh said, why didn't you mention me? And so it's a bit like when I was going to the CGIR work, I think there's a ton of things going on, and I either I need uh, 20 minutes to do it, or I will forget people. So let me take a, a step higher, okay? And I think what we are really trying to make a big contribution, I think it's different from the past, is to take uh, what I would call a bundling and a systems approach, okay? And so there, the, the major innovation in our 2030 research strategy, I think, is that we really approach it from an integrated frame, both vertically and, and horizontally. On the horizontal one, if you want, this is where uh, the bundling comes in. So you need innovations both at the technological side, at the management side, and at the policy side or institutional and the macro thing. And our in, uh, research strategy really tries to integrate it. Okay? And I think it's crucial. I mean, uh, several of the speakers today have said, you know, we need new technologies, but there's a ton of technologies available which are just not used. And why are they not used? Is because the people who should use them I don't have access to them, they don't have access to finance to invest in them, or to insurance mechanisms to protect them against the risk, or uh, for a number of other reasons, or the policy, the incentives are not there to use them, the cost-benefit ratio is not right. And so that means you have to address all of these things to make this happen. And we've seen a number of examples which were given this uh, crucial, and so people have talked about nutrition this morning and just now. Um, and also on the farming level, what we see today is that our value chains are much more integrated than they were 30, 40 years ago, both globally but also locally, I think. And that means whatever happens on the consumer side has a direct impact on the farm side and vice versa. And that means both at the policy side, the institutional side, you have to look this, consider this as a system, incorporate all of this thing. And that is really also both this horizontal and this vertical integration, if you want, of food, land, and water system is at the heart of, of what we try to do, and I think it's a major step forward. Thank you, Dr. Yuan. Um, absolutely, you're right. We will be talking about some of those challenges, um, not only financing, but also some of the scalability questions and uptake uh, questions uh, later. But let me just um, uh, come to the financing questions, the funding questions. And all these innovations that you spoke about obviously require um, uh, fund fundamentally some of the funding um, if, 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 not, if that's not the only thing, obviously, funding is important. So coming to Dr. Claudia, what are, what are the long-term trends 
that, that you see in the data on financial flows to agriculture, uh, more generally towards transformation of agri-food systems, but also more specifically to research and innovation of it. Thanks again, Sarda. <clears throat> it's kind of extraordinary when you sort of step back and look at these trends. If you remember in 2016, when we all agreed this, uh, the uh, sustainable development goals, we knew it was a stretch, but the global community chose as their target the ending of hunger by 2030. What's happened since then? Hunger has actually risen for the first time in decades, and it rose even before COVID, although we did see, I think, 150 million were between 5 and 30 percent by the year 2100. And even the food that we do produce as temperatures rise is seen to have lower nutritive value. So I'm getting to the financing point because what's extraordinary is this. Everything that we're seeing suggests we need to invest more. We need to lean in and we need to invest more in agriculture and food systems. But what have we seen instead? We've seen a 10% decline in the last 10 years in investments in agriculture. We also see with all the change that we're undergoing that arguably we need investment in new and uh, in, in new innovations to meet these new challenges. And as has been said very clearly, this doesn't have to be something that's never existed before. It can be new to you, but we all need to be doing things differently. But what do we see instead of all of that new uh, financing for new uh, innovations? What we're seeing is an incredibly yawning gap between what we know we need to invest in research and innovation and what we are seeing. So this was quoted several times today. For example, Marco was saying that the COSI report the, um, on, on sustainable intensification indicated a $15.2 billion annual gap in what we need to be investing in agricultural innovation to end hunger. And we also see similarly imbalanced trends with regard to climate change. We know that food systems are a major source of emissions, um, but we also know that they're very central to this climate solution space. So we see 20 to 30 percent of emissions in agriculture and 4 percent of climate funding in agriculture. And this is despite the fact that uh, Yo's scientists at IFPRI tell us that if we transform intentionally, our food systems could become a sink for global carbon, a net sink by 2050, yet we're, we're investing 4%. And in particular, let me say that the investments in smallholder farmers is woefully inadequate. Our smallholder farmers, 500 million people across the world that produce a third of our global food supply, and we know they sit right on the front lines of climate adaptation and impact, Climate finance, 1.7% of climate finance goes to the benefit of small-scale farmers. So the trends that we're seeing are very clear, unfortunately. The trends that we're seeing are increasing needs, clear increasing needs. Uh, and perhaps their, their potential impact as well. If, if PRI and, and CGIR um, had all those additional funds, um, what additional, what agri agricultural technologies are are currently underfunded um, and required, required an increase in, in investment in, in agriculture, in your opinion. Um, thank you very much. I, um, I think if you would ask the audience here, particularly our colleagues from the CGIR, they would say all of it is uh, underfunded probably. We are actually, I mean, the way we have designed our portfolio to target a high impact is we have designed it as a growth portfolio. Growth, that means that we are, we have designed, it's organized now in 33 initiatives, all focused on specific innovation, specific areas of, of innovation in these three different areas I just explained. And there we can expand them. We can expand them geographically, we expand them in terms of depth, but also in terms of reach and extension and, and integration with partners particularly as well. So there is a lot of room for growth in, in the portfolio that we have expanded. But I think it was really important if you look at the financing, we have to see this in a much broader framework, I think. So in, I was part of the leadership of the finance leader of the Food Systems Summit, okay, and there we designed a food finance agriculture for the 21st century. And there, actually, if you think about the financial flows, okay, it's, it's not just getting donors to fund uh, our work, but actually it's like we have several uh, very important flows. The, 
The most important one is consumer expenditures on food, actually, or, or on products more broadly. Then, uh, basically, investments in the private sector, capital markets, I mean, the Wall Streets of the world. Um, and then, of course, uh, of public investments by governments and by international organizations, also from the public side and mixed uh, public here is spent every year already now. We don't need anything in addition to that on agricultural subsidies in the world. A lot of that is very inefficient in terms of addressing the things we are trying to address. So if we can just reorganize these subsidies, repurpose, that's the word that we're using now, we can have a major impact. My final point is that our work at CGIR can also contribute to making finance more accessible to the things. So we can actually uh, enhance, have innovation on the finance side. There's a number of things that we do. Value chain finance is extremely important. We have an initiative on rethinking markets and value chains, which has an important component on that. We have an initiative or a new uh, sustainable finance hub where we work on developing data indicators so we can actually link our work to the uh, global capital markets and the agents there. And then finance, uh, finally, on the, on the repurposing area, we do a lot of really interesting work, which actually now is used by OECD, FAO, the World Bank, etc., and hopefully can contribute to policy. Thank you, uh, Doctor. Um, let me just turn to Dr. Oboko on um, how some of these funding trends have impacted your work and shaped your work at not only just the South African Council for Natural Scientific Professions, but also your previous work at National Research Foundation for South Africa as well. Could you tell us how your work has been shaped by some of these trends in funding that we see? Yes. Um we're looking at South Africa with some of the competing interests and priorities as well. So what we have seen is that, yes, uh, government does fund uh, research, but uh, the, the to take some of that funding to other you know, priorities uh, f from a social uh, perspective. So with SACNAS, we are a registration and a regulatory body for natural scientists uh, in South Africa. We also provide advice uh, to government on matters that uh, pertains to science uh, development. And most importantly, our work also uh, covers uh, training and uh, capacity building for our scientists as part of lifelong training, but also you know, generating and ensuring that we have the next cohort of young people that will take over going forward. So we don't want to leave anyone behind, and that is the motto that we have adopted to say that we want these young people to be the ones that are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. So that is the one particular component of our work uh, that we pride ourselves in, in terms of you know, harnessing this new talent and ensuring that you know, they get the necessary skills, not only as scientists, but also in business, in some of the soft skills. So there's quite a lot of work that we're doing to en ensure that you know, we build that necessary capacity. So with now these challenges uh, that has been brought about with the funding, we find that we cannot really make that impact and have a bigger pool uh, of scientists, especially the younger ones, the youth and the women who are part of our portfolio and uh, the target um, constituents that we're looking at. Within the NRF, NRF is a National Research Foundation in South Africa. It provides funding and it supports our postgraduate students as well as our researchers as with funding. It also supports in terms of you know, some of these cutting edge infrastructure in the laboratories in, when they will be able to see some of the fruits uh, going forward. But what I wanted to also uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, provide is another example in terms of knowledge uh, creation, but we are also focusing on innovation so that all this work can contribute to national development. So it's not research for the sake of research, but at the end of the day, the end goal is that this research can help you know, and solve some of our grand societal uh, challenges and make an impact and therefore enhance the livelihoods of our people. So that is why we are advocating for more and robust uh, investment in research, understanding that if we are to put money on research, will see that return on that investment. And that has been you know, very visible in developed uh, countries. And uh, we're happy that with government, we have progressive policies that also ensures that. But as I indicated as well, one of the areas which NRF also want to spearhead going forward is that we must look at some of these promising uh, research uh, outputs 
and also look at commercialization so that we can have new products, you know, services, as well as uh, processes that are coming out of the research endeavors. So we are also trying to ensure that the researchers, they don't just do work and produce, you know, publications, but their research, you know, makes an impact out there because we do need to transform, we do need, you know, to make a change, and it is only through science, technology, and innovation. So our work really says we must invest in research, and only then will we be able to see the benefits, and we will we'll be able then food systems. Uh, you see, first of all, uh, 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 this uh, realization that uh, uh, manufacturing sector has not lived up to the expectation to pull labor out of agriculture. First argument that uh, in a country where half of uh, workforce uh, is engaged in uh, agriculture, we cannot afford to uh, ignore uh, agriculture. Now, if we have to transform agriculture, we have to uh, look at uh, agriculture search, technology and innovations because search create possibilities. Policy and institution only harness the possibilities which are created by the, uh, uh, by the, uh, by the, uh, by the uh, uh, search. And also, we have a um, uh, lot of uh, evidence-based uh, uh, results uh, to convince uh, 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 the, the uh, political class to uh, pay more attention to agriculture and women agriculture to agriculture R&D, and some of those are as follows. If you look at poverty, the reducing power of different investment, the highest power is of investment made in agriculture search. Investment in road, investment in education, investment in market come after that. So if we want a of growth, if we want to rest poverty, then I think the best candidate is investment in total 70, 80 percent water in Indian agriculture, 40 percent of land in many countries in agriculture. So if we want to uh, uh, pay attention to sustainability, we have to look at agriculture. We are not able to save water out of agriculture. We cannot provide required water for industry and human consumption. A saving of water from agriculture can come if research can pass the method through which we can increase water use efficiency. Similar thing applied to agriculture that uh, you have 40 percent area under, uh, under crop, uh, very little area is available for environmental uh, assumption. So it is because of this role of uh, agriculture and realization about the uh, role of agriculture becoming much, much more important even in non-conventional areas like employment and job creation. And I can keep adding that uh, another uh, uh, aspect, uh, which uh, another argument which we need to convince uh, uh, the government to pay more attention to agriculture is that agriculture growth is much superior than growth rate of uh, uh, other sector. For example, you see a lot of resilience in agriculture growth. Even during COVID time, in most of the country, agriculture growth was intact. During the global financial crisis, agriculture growth was intact. Even because of this crisis of uh, Ukraine, Russia, uh, conflict and war, you find that supplies have been affected, global movement has been affected. But if you look at the investment production, uh, uh, people who are the Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, let me speak a similar question. Uh, let me ask uh, a similar question to Dr. Kanayo. Um, obviously, there are enormous uh, pressures when it comes to donors' funding and where it should be channeled. And, and I think yourself or someone else spoke about you know, how, how priorities changed after COVID. So the question for you is, what are some of the levers and approaches that, that, um, uh, that you are maintaining so that the focus is on funding for agri-food systems? both for donors and, and partner uh, countries? Well, you know, f f first of all, um, uh, let's all accept that we are researchers or scientists 
or our, our business is, you know, generating technologies or innovations, if you wish to call them. But we are not into advocacy. We're not very good at selling ourselves, our products. That's something we don't do very well. Right now, in this hall, we're talking to ourselves, although we are streaming. And we are using language that nobody else understands. So let's, let's, let's be realistic. And I don't think the issue is that we just lack enough investment in agriculture. There's a lot of money out there, I bet you. We don't know how to go about it. We're not thinking outside the box. Can somebody tell me why the CGIR, how do we communicate? How do we sell them? That's the problem. You know, as I said earlier, we just think that or produ producing a, a miracle variety of rice, or QPM, quality protein maize, or corn, depends on which language you're speaking, English or American. <laughs> but seriously, you know, what donors are asking for is results. But when I say results, let me be more specific here. Because I had this experience at IFAD, and a lot of my colleagues here or at that time used to come and visit. And we speak the same language. It's not just investment and finance. Yes, of course, more investment and finance would be helpful. But we need evidence of more impact by dollar invested, value for money. What has one dollar of research done to the lives of the, of the farmer, of the rural populations? Not in just in terms of feeding themselves, in terms of reducing poverty. How do we associate these new technologies and these new types of business that we're doing to poverty reduction? More girls in school. But even counterintuitively, in a village setting, more children go into the local clinic. You will say more people are getting sick because more people are going to the hospital. No, because they can now afford to buy medication. Link that to the new technologies that we have generated. Improved nutrition cohesive societies and more jobs for youth. How do we sell ourselves? The world today produces more food than we can consume. That is a fact. But one third of it is lost, goes to waste. In Africa, up to 40% of the food that is produced is lost due to post-harvest, poor infrastructure, poor roads. And 57% of harvested crop is not available for consumption. What percentage of soya bean production worldwide is consumed by humans? Less than 10%. 90% goes to animals. I can give you more statistics. The 40% of food, of food loss in Africa is about $40 billion annually. It can feed about 50 million Africans. I mean, we can go on and on. I think basically what we have to, we have to re begin to rethink the way we do business. It's the truth. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are a unique institution. I think the one CGIR transformation is a great transformation. It's a great task. And I'm glad we're finally doing it after 50 years. I, I, I don't think there's anyone here, perhaps only Namanga, who is older than me in the system. I know what I'm talking about. But you know, to answer your question, you know, frankly speaking, 
we have a lot of innovations. You know, just yesterday or two days ago, I had Helen from um, SIP was telling me about rice, potato into cropping, and the potential. I mean, I never heard about that. But one of my African colleagues said, oh, yes, but my, my, in, my, in my place, that's, what, that's how we grow it. And that is incredible. It's yet, not to, it's yet to be. Now, for, for SIP to transfer that technology to other parts of Af to, to Africa, that initiative or that, that, that uh, 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 effort is not being funded. But it is, has great potential. I mean, I can go on and on. This is, I'm very passionate about this, about the CGRL. I, I don't have to convince you. I'm talking to the, to, to the uh, converted. But please, let's learn how to sell our business outside talking to ourselves. We do too much talk. Thank you, Dr. Kenayo. Uh, absolutely, that's an important point, um, how, how we communicate the value for money that we bring in needs to be communicated out to the world. Absolutely agree to fill up um, that we need to be, and this entire community needs to be careful. And, and you know, every time there is, a, there is a question of scaling up any, any innovation. A minute and a half. <laughs> Well, I mean, I can, I mean, not, it's, just, it's not just Nerica. Nerica was developed very, well, Nerica is a product of biotechnology, but it's not a GMO. Okay, I hope that's clear. <laughs> uh, very simple. We had a very young scientist at the time, Monty, Monty Jones, who discovered that because we, he did not have the necessary uh, substrate or medium for tissue culture, was in China, and while he was there, he discovered that he could use coconut milk. So coconut milk was the key to his success. Tissue culture, hybridization of African rice with Asian rice. Glabarina, Glabarina versus Sativa. I still remember the Latin names. But what happened after, after it was generated or produced and he was testing his, uh, his rices in Korogo in northern, northern Cote d'Ivoire, we are very fortunate to have a friend of us who was working for Sasakawa Global. Sasakawa took that technology and spread it out across West Africa. Conakry, Guinea, Burkina Faso, and Sasakawa Global was into a great extension service working with national programs, the partnership. Yes, we generated the product, but somebody else helped us to scale it. So scaling up again is partnership. And I, I know that you have expertise. I think people say Africa Rice is a small center. I say Africa Rice is the biggest center because we work with our national partners. All member states belong to one or other task force. And these are national scientists. No other center has this network. So we can take our products and that's it. Pass them on through the network of task forces and they are tested across regions in Africa. And that's why, how, how Nerica was spread. But I can give you another recent example funded by the African Development Bank, TART, Technology, uh, what is it, Sanginga, how was it, TART, Technology for African Agricultural Transformation. That's right. And that's, for those of you who are not aware of it, TART, current phase of TART, has been able to generate income transformation of livelihoods, particularly in Sudan and Ethiopia, on wheat production. 27 countries have benefited from this. And I think that how many million are farmers? And, and touch two is being discussed, and I'm pretty sure, Monty, uh, sorry, uh, Harold and his colleagues will be talking about that in the next session. So basically, the spread of Nerica, or the scaling out of Nerica, is, again, partnership. And as Namanga said, it is not integration of centers or, or collaborators or networks. It is collaboration and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, let me ask that question to Dr. Oboko as well, um, the scalability and scaling of this um, uh, innovation. And uh, uh, Dr. Oboko, you, you have served as the presidential commissioner 
on the on the fourth industrial revolution commission in south africa and obviously worked extensively on scaling agriculture uh, technology what do you think this this te technological innovation can do to help us scale um, some of these these researches and, and innovations in addition to collaboration and partnership that that doctor um, spoke about already also inequality in the country so you took it upon himself uh, to appoint a uh, 33 member a commission uh, that will look at how can we as a country harness uh, these emerging uh, technologies uh, in, in order to ensure that you know we drive uh, economic growth but we become also competent and position South Africa as the 4IR hub uh, in the continent and critical to this was the formation of that uh, commission but also some of the work streams that looked at critical areas that can help uh, South Africa to move forward uh, namely infrastructure, you know, capacity building, you know, future workforce and youth employment uh, in particular, but also starting, you know, from, you know, the schooling level up until university. What kind of a workforce are we looking at? So it was quite a holistic uh, venture. And at the end of the day, we came up with 11 recommendations and key was agriculture being one of the key sectors uh, in the country. And through our national development plan, where we understood that we needed to create at least a million jobs from agriculture, especially in the rural areas, and using these key innovative uh, technologies uh, from you know, your, your uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, uh, 3D printing, uh, your genomics, and biotechnology was also very key as another tool that can also be harnessed and utilized you know, from an agricultural perspective. So quite a number of uh, provinces within the country, they adopted that strategy. We had it gazetted in 2020, now it's under implementation, and we are seeing that it is again government, the private sector, that public-private sector partnership as well, that is forging ahead and utilizing this uh, national blueprint to ensure that we move forward as a country in, from an agricultural uh, perspective. So, puts. so this is what some of these technologies are bringing and how we've been able to harness and also scale them to ensure that you know, there is access uh, to these technologies uh, widely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oboko. Uh, let me ask the last question to Dr. Claudia and then I'll open up the floor um, for, for questions. Um, Dr. Claudia, when we talk about scaling up innovations, do you see co-creation of solutions as one way to I enable your scaling up more easily? And how, how does CGIR ensure that these agricultural solutions are co-created, um, you know, and taking into account context specifics and including gender considerations? Thank you very much. In fact, we think that partnership lies absolutely at the heart of scaling. If we don't work with partners on the right issues, if we don't work with partners to find the right solutions, and if we don't engage them in a vision for scaling, then our solutions remain on the library shelf and never make it to the market shelf or the kitchen pantry. So what we're trying to do to really assure that in CGIR is uh, we have under the one CGIR a new strategy for all centers together, a 2030 strategy, and in that we have a very specific theory of change. How is it that we're going to make our impact? And we see partnership embedded at three distinct points in that theory of change. We design how we will identify what we do, and with that, there may be a unique set of, set of partners that we need to discuss. Might be farmers groups, women's groups. So what we try to do is ensure that from the very first thought before we begin our work, we're engaging with partners. They help us to identify the priorities. They help us to ensure that we're coming to appropriate and feasible solutions. They help us to contextualize, because context is everything. It's the biophysical context, surely, but it's also the economic context. It's also the social context. It's also the, the policy context. It's even the intra-family context, which can be very important. And that arguably gets us to the question around gender. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak to that. This is a particularly important area of work. And I'm delighted to see our impact platform uh, champion here, Nicolene Dehan. Women shoulder a very disproportionate burden of the current global food crisis. Today, 
it is estimated, CARE put out a report that suggested that 150 million more women than men face food insecurity. And I didn't just misspeak. 150 million more women than men face food insecurity in 2021. In 2018, it was bad enough. It was 18 million more women than men. 150. The, 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 the disparity, the inequity of women and men in terms of what they, uh, what they, uh, what they suffer from, but also what the better, more resilient decisions are made. More diversity in crops, more resilient farming practices, better, more resilient farming, uh, more nutritional farming. So women are very much uh, an, an, a stakeholder partner, partner group that we need to work much more with, and really an important lever. But what we try to do in the CG, again, is we try to find the right partners at each appropriate stage in everything we do, at identification, at solution co-development, and at co-delivery, to ensure that we're doing the right things, we're delivering the right things, and they are being delivered to farmers. We do that through our theory of change. We do that through our regional directors and their teams in country partnerships. Um, and we knew, do that in every design team um, under CGIR. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Claudia. Uh, with that, let me just open up for any questions from the audience. Um, we can take a couple, if there are any. Right at the back. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much indeed for a really provocative and interesting discussion from the panel. I really enjoyed it. My question is, though, going to be somewhat provocative. 40% uh, 40 of GDP in agriculture is generated from the livestock sector. And it's higher in many, many developing countries, particularly in Africa. Yet this morning, I've not heard one single mention of a livestock or a livestock species. So I put to the panel, does that mean in your system transformation, in your future, there is no role for livestock? And if there is, why is it not being discussed? And I repeat, 40% at a minimum of GDP. Forests, crops, tree crops, goods, sheep, rabbits, that's agriculture. Okay? So... When you hear Dr. Wanze or Dr. Kanayo talk about agriculture, it's all inclusive. Thank you. Uh, just to add to that, the figures I was quoting earlier, um, when we said agriculture actually encompasses all of that, including fisheries as well, by the way, when we talk about fund, funding towards that, uh, yeah, all the fish as well. Um, yes, please, right here. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Mufak Shbour. I am an ICARDA board member. Uh, let me please uh, set this in different way or it might be out of the, the road you are going. We are speaking about food security and malnutrition and etc. etc. And the climate change, I, I believe it's a fundamental issue, yes. But sometimes we have an emerging situation, like the recent conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And the CG did very good analytical study about the impact and the implication of this situation on food security and others. So how can we benefit from this case and from this lesson, from this exercise? To fit security, such situation might affect in much more and bigger, uh, let's say, a percent or uh, extent to the food security. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Claudio, you want to take the question? Or Dr. Johan? I'm not coming out. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the question. It's extremely relevant, of course. Uh, in response to the, climate, to the crisis, we've developed at the CGIR level a seven-point innovation program, which really target, brought forward very specific areas where we can uh, address these things going forward. Okay, and so <clears throat> because the climate, the, sorry, the crisis is a combination of short-run, 
medium run and structural problem, much more longer run. So our, our approach, our program has both all three of these components, okay? Part of it's, for example, early warning systems, which really allow us to anticipate these things going forward. Then a number of innovations in livestock sector, in seeds, et cetera. In uh, fertilizer, a big thing, okay? I think fertilizer has been a bit on the back burner a bit, and it's so important what we can, I think we're really unique in the world to do that. I mean, we have to think it from a soil fertility perspective, I think, where a lot of the, the centers are doing a lot of work, link that with the policy agenda. There's so many fertilizer subsidies in the world, the trade agenda as well. And so we have these, probably don't have time to go through all the seven points here, but we really designed the structure there, and this is being integrated in the work that we're doing now going forward. Thank you, Doctor. One last, uh, do you want to respond? Sure. Because it's, it's been really exciting to see the one CGIR come together in response to this current conflict situation. But what we're also trying to do is think about the next focus on farming in conflict and fragile contexts. We don't know yet what might be different there, what might be needed. Similarly, we know that the world is very rapidly urbanizing. And so this year we have just launched our first CGIR initiative on urban and peri-urban agriculture. So we're trying to look forward to anticipate where the challenges of agriculture and food systems will be, not just this morning where we're delighted that we're responding as quickly as we can to the urgencies of the day, but to really look forward and prepare ourselves and prepare solutions for our small scale farmers and food systems more broadly. Dr. Claudia, one, uh, apologies, the one last question, just, just to be mindful of gender. Uh, Alice, you, you want to ask that last question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent panel. Um, and my name is Alice Rueza. I am an assistant board member. Uh, mine is um, very much related to what uh, Dr. Kanai was talking about, the, the way we sell ourselves. And, and it's very much related to finance. Because when you look at ODA, 179 billion, climate finance, 100 billion, Biodiversity next week in Montreal, we're going to be negotiating more money, private finance. So there is money, but, but why is it that we're not leveraging that money for agriculture because we still have woo for finance? So how can we connect the dots? Actually, my question to the panel is, going forward, how can we connect the dots so that the person making decisions about money knows that agriculture actually is a solution to whether it's biodiversity, whether it's climate, uh, whether it's development for that matter. I'm curious to hear how you're going to connect those dots. Thanks. Can I say something? Governments put agriculture, agricultural research as a priority in their development agenda. Well, at, at IFAD, we gave more money to countries as loans for agricultural programs and projects than to institutions as grants. But the CGIRL could get more money through those by making, making sure that the governments included CGI technologies and contributions in those. So we have to learn how to, again, I come back to how we advocate. And I think part of the problem that we have to face in Africa is that our policymakers go beyond commitments and just promises. They have to make agriculture the priority of priorities, not just in promises, but when they make their budget requests for ODA or whatever you call it. And by the way, as you know, the African continent alone generates seven trillion dollars. Development assistance is how many billion? Exactly. So there's enough money in the country, on the continent, sorry. And we have to learn how to advocate. So for those of you who are going to become country coordinators or whatever titles you have, original directors and so on, please, let's develop an approach to be sure that governments put agriculture, agricultural research into their budgets and insist that when they, when they take loans or they get grants from the financing institutions, that it is allocated and that the CGIR is the first port of call for those for those programs and where the amount is and I think for example the work on sustainable finance which is starting now and I think they're the only comment is we should have started that long time ago we should have been way ahead but at least we are starting to work on it and you can also link it to 
uh, actually the point here on the World Bank loans, IMF loans, etc. There, you know, accessing these things, and that also takes a totally different way of working with them than we've had in the past. Thank you, Doctor. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately, uh, but I just want to conclude um, by giving our panelists one last chance to respond to one last question, which is about the future, right? Um, and of course, we all know um, that it is a difficult time at the moment with the climate crises, ongoing war, and also other economic challenges as well, and all of those are impacting um, uh, uh, food security. So the question is really, and, and again, if you can keep it brief, please, um, what gives you hope that our, our agri-food systems will be better by 2030, and how do you foresee them to look like in 2050? Perhaps. I can give the floor to Dr. Kanayo to start. You want me to eat my words now? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> what I can, I can say as emerging at least, let, let, me, let me say for Nigeria, what's emerging? I see a lot of younger, younger uh, uh, agri-food uh, agri companies coming up. Uh, a good example, I'm chair of AgroRights. It's a small agricultural company growing rice, working with farmers, uh, uh, um, sesame, and I forgot what other crop, and actually exporting them, as well as, you know. Inter so there are a lot of young people going to agriculture. Uh, there's grow tra there's um, grow tractor, which is renting out tractors to farmers in many parts. So I think the future, and if, if, if we can show them that they can make money out of agriculture, and, and they're making it, then the future is good. And, they, and look at all the technologies there. Look at what we've been talking about today. Our generation is done. All I can do is talk and advise. <laughs> but the future for agriculture, at least for Africa, is in our younger generation. Sure, money can move us all. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, Dr. Oboko. Yes, I fully agree with uh, what Dr. Kanawi has just indicated now, that the future really is in the hands of our youth. And when you look at, as you said, that, you know, is there hope? Without hope, it means that we, we are dead. And then we don't have a choice, really. We have to be intentional going forward, planning for that future and ensuring that, you know, the next generation that is going to come, you know, we have made sure that everything, all the systems are in place. We have, you know, done everything that we can in, you know, to ensure that whatever that we hand to them, it is sustainable and it can really generate whatever that we want to see in terms of um, you know, prosperity for the continent but also for the world, for us as human beings uh, to thrive because as we know climate change is not only just a threat but it's a threat to humankind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oboko. Dr. Yuan? Yes, I think also just, I think, I mean, we are facing enormous challenges, right? And it's uh, all the, the perfect storm system, but it also, I mean, I think it's a moment for huge opportunities. I mean, if you look at the technologies there, digital technologies are huge opportunities. Energy, solar power, for example, has it, the genetics, all the progress that we're making. And at the same time, which changed the whole European food supply chains and later on global because a lot of these traceability standards were exported. So shocks can change policy. Uh, uh, and global policy and have a major impact on food systems. So I think um, I, I really do want to want to under, I mean, underestimate the challenges, but I think we should also not underestimate the opportunities. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yohan. I believe Dr. Ramesh has dropped off already. Um, yeah, Dr. Claudia. Well, let me just say that um, on the one hand, I am truly worried about the direction of our food systems. But I actually think that that's the good news because I'm usually the last person to worry. I have a big optimism bias personally, and I am worried. And I see that worry in the conversations that we've had. This is what Yo is saying. There is a real recognition, an increasing recognition that the trajectory of our food systems is unsustainable and uh, not where we want to be going. And with that recognition, I become, again, optimistic. Because what I see every time that I speak with my colleagues at the CGIR is I see such innovation, I see such energy, I see such imagination and creativity, and I see evidence of results. It's extraordinary 
when you go through and you speak to the scientists at CGIR. The effort that you put in with 20, 30, 40 percent improvements in, in, in everything you can think of, every aspect of what we're doing, the potential is absolutely extraordinary. I'm amazed and I'm inspired by my colleagues. And that's why I'm optimistic that we need to arrive as Dr. Yeah, and let's end on that optimism. Um, I want to thank all of you here and Dr. Ramesh as well, uh, who joined us from India. Thank you so much. It has been uh, a really an insightful discussion. And thank you, everyone um, here in the room, to, to listen to us so passionately. Thank you so much. So I recognize that we're entering that dangerous territory between lunch and the final few items. I would like to see if we can return to the video of Dr. Jürgen Vogelé that we attempted to play earlier to see if we can get the sound working. I'll invite the panelists to leave the stage now. Thank you. Okay, we, we don't seem to have the sound on that, um, which is a shame because it was working in our test earlier, but perhaps we can play it later uh, in this afternoon's session. So now, um, for our final, uh, our final remarks, I'm going to invite Dr. Marco Ferroni back to the stage to formally close our CGR roundtable event. Marco, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lotte. So, uh, uh, as usual, at this stage, you don't want to hear from me. You don't want to hear probably from anybody because uh, the next item on the agenda is probably lunch. I was asked to, can I give the first part but not the second part of the necessary answer in terms of referring to the integrated nature of livestock and crops and trees and all other farming activities at the farm level. Our problem is or has been until recently, until some of the initiatives came about, and it's still early days for the initiatives, that we do not have that integration in our work of science and innovation to mimic the integration of what is going on at the farm level. And that is where we have got to get much better. My second point has to do with uh, our long discussion about uh, finance and how bad we are at making our case uh, and so on. And I will not uh, say more about this, but. I think the path to the solution there is that we have to get better at explaining how agriculture is part of the solution as different from part of the problem when it comes to climate, equity, food security and nutrition, income and economic growth. The third topic, I don't know where it, where it is. Oh, yeah. We talked about the bundling approach, uh, systems approach horizontally and vertically bringing technology, policy and institutional change and the, the whole regulatory question and the question of incentives under one hat together, because incentives determine people's behavior, and that behavior can be destructive or constructive. Um, and I think you said that this is the way forward, and I think that it, I agree in as much as this is an essential tenet of one CGIR. We created one CGIR so that we could develop a systems approach which necessarily enables, requires us to work together, uh, us to work together across systems or uh, across the system or at least subsets of the system for given particular tasks. Um, yes, where are we now? Okay, I agree with that. Context is everything. Context um, at the macro and at the micro level in many different dimensions. Um, we heard, and this is a reflection on the previous panel during which I had to multitask, so I'm not attempting to summarize that. A lot about water and climate, and here is my formulation of that conclusion, which is the climate crisis is a water crisis. Food is a derived problem. And finally, we heard that the future is not bright, but at the same time then we heard that the future is in our hand and we know and have heard at this on, on, along these, this panel how CGIR not only can help, but does help. Now, um, I wanted to just say this is likely my last opportunity to address this group in my current role and therefore a moment of reflection, if I may, over three years ago in response to demand from our country, regional science and funding partners, we began a progress, a process of boldly reimagining both our mission and our strategy. And I think that we have come a very long way. It's never finished. 
That's natural, because life goes on, the institution goes on, the context changes. But what we have achieved is unprecedented by the standards of past attempts of CGIAR reform. We have a research and innovation strategy to 2030 and beyond, underpinned by the systems approach that we have just managed, uh, mentioned, that acknowledges and addresses the overlapping challenges facing food, land, and water systems. We have 32 uh, um, now large-scale initiatives that are funded and operational. We have adopted a version of unified car. I know that change is never easy, easy, but as we approach the end of this phase of the reform, and again, I said before, it is not, uh, you know, we're not finished, and there are certainly going to be challenges ahead. And as I approach my the end of my term as uh, board chair, I remain optimistic. I strongly believe that our reforms, our strategy, and more uh, now our more integrated teams make us a better placed and uh, a better placed uh, make us better placed and more united to do what CGIR does best, namely science for humanity's greatest challenges. Now more than ever, the world as the previous panel and the one before has shown, and smallholder farmers everywhere need steadfast and effective multilateral cooperation underpinned by best-in-class science, research, and innovation. And our discussion here today has framed the urgency of this, and we have our destination in sight. And since we do have our destination in sight, colleagues, let us go there together. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. I hope you had a great lunch. Um, we're continuing the program. Hello. Can I have your attention, please? We're continuing the program. Um, this will be the second bit. I think there's some overlap, but it doesn't matter. We're going to get more people coming in. Um, as you all know, we have this program that's going to talk about the, um, I would call it the, the, the partnership, the new partnership that we're trying to, or the consolidated partnership that we're trying to develop between the CGIR and the African um, research and innovation systems or institutions. Um, and um, we, we have today, as moderator of the session, Dr. Kanayo Nwanze. You had him um, during the panel session, and you know that he's well um, informed about the system, we can have a moderator better than him. So um, he ha he's going to lead us through, and um, without wasting any more time, I would like to hand over the mic to um, Dr. Kanayo Nwanze. For those who don't know me, I'm Harold Roy Macaulay. I'm the Director General of Africa Rice. And uh, welcome again, everyone, to uh, this uh, afternoon session on the um, presentation of the initial draft of the Abidjan 2 Communique Action Plan. As Harold said, I'm supposed to be your moderator. And for the sake of time, I will just go straight onto the agenda and share with you uh, what is expected this afternoon. Um, we'll have an uh, opening remarks uh, by uh, Alun Fall. He's online, yeah, in the blue shirt. <laughs> Uh, who is the uh, chair of the FARA board and followed by um, um, an address by Marco. A few, oh, okay. uh, a remark, uh, a, a remark, a remark by, by Marco and then we'll have a short presentation of the communique, communique by myself. <laughs> And somebody trying to take over my role. <laughs> and then after that, then we will have a presentation of the initial draft of the Abidjan to communicate action plan by Yemi Akimbamijo, who is the executive uh, director of FARA. Uh, we'll have a feedback. Um, an input session. We were hoping to get Kwesi Atakra uh, to join us, but um, unfortunately uh, his flight was cancelled. And have the opening remarks by the chair of FARA, uh, FARA board, uh, Dr. Alun Fal. I wish I was there to meet you guys, you know, 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fall, uh, for those um, opening remarks and for the, um, you actually have challenged us uh, in your statements to quite a few things and I won't try to summarize them. Uh, it now gives me a pleasure to invite uh, Marco. Um, the audience, to the fact that we have you here as a chair because few people are as well qualified as you to address moderator of the session, chairperson of the session, as m qualified to be able to speak from the depth of experience on the topic of the day, which is partnership. I want to also begin by saluting my friend and colleague Alion Fall, co-secretary of the Abidjan Communique, along with the president of the African Development Bank, the Agriculture Commissioner of the AU, and myself, on behalf of CGIAR. The Abidjan Communique is a statement of intent, and the intent is for all of us to get to work and work together a lot better. And to do that exactly along the lines of what Aliun has so eloquently outlined. The intent is intended to be converted into a plan that gives us a roadmap for actual work. 
And that plan, as I understand it, is in the process of being developed. I think we have an initial draft. It requires a lot of work, more work of review by all of us, all of us in the room, everybody online and many more, so that we get it right. I want to thank doctors Yemi Akimbamijo, the CEO of FARA, and Dr. Harold McCauley, the CEO of Africa Rise, and the managing director of regions and partnership in CGIR for being the two drivers, the co-authors, the co-conspirators. Could be, and that is the recommendation I've certainly given to the leadership team, the topic, the theme. We have to get better at partnership. I am not saying we are bad. Everywhere where we, CGIR, have had impact, we have by definition gone through a process of innovation, and there is no process of innovation without partnership. So we have a record of achievement in partnership, but we need to do a lot better, and particularly so in Africa. If you look at the history of CGIR, I think we can say, and I don't mean to be caricature, giving you a caricature, and because you know, the differentiated analysis will always find fault in, fault in any generalization, so I'll be cautious, but I'm still going to tell you that I believe if you look at the historical trajectory of CGIR, then in Asia and LAC, we have complemented and empowered the NARS. Whereas in Africa, where we started with a much lower average level of capacity at the national level in terms of national agricultural research pro systems, we have tended to substitute for them. That's no recipe for empowerment and capacity, build capacity building and building up the necessary institution, institutions that an institutional landscape across all uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of the dimensions of the sector that every country must have if they aspire to meaningful agricultural development. So let's think about this knowledge of how can mean a whole lot, but which it should not be the same approach across all countries. Our approach should be tailored to the needs and the capabilities of the country and to the um, articulation of what the country and the particular NARS, National Re Agricultural Research System, says that it wants for its country's agriculture. So I think that as we think about how to get better, or if you wish, even better at partnerships, and how to begin to implement and a, a, a way of working that Aliun has very eloquently described, then I think what I'm saying here is probably one of the items of guidance that we should keep in mind as we define how we go forward. I think national agricultural research systems in Africa need to be strengthened in major ways to address all of the challenges that we know in terms of agriculture. There is a need for a much higher degree of food self-sufficiency or food sovereignty in, 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 in on the continent. And that requires much higher yields for starters, whether it be in livestock or in crops. And so the question becomes how to go about that. And I think uh, beyond what I just said, the question is it becomes in terms of how to go about it. The derived question is how, what are, what are the implications for how CGIR would best work country by country line of production by line of production with the con corresponding national agricultural research system. And to conclude, it is in this context, marrying the offer with the demand, or probably I should have said it the other way around, articulating the demand and then honing our organization's offer. That's one CGIR, and, there, and, and that is the space where the re our new function, newly created function of regional directors and country coordinators that respond to the full canvas of the potential offer of CGIR comes in. This is, in a few words, how I view the uh, opportunity for deepened partnership with African agricultural institutions. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Marco. It was very, very good. It um, uh, was more than a remark. <laughs> it actually uh, stimulates further discussion that we're going to have this afternoon. I really appreciate your making the time to share the, your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. That takes us to the next uh, item on the agenda, uh, which, um, which, uh, which is the presentation of the communique, which I am supposed to do. So I'm going to try and do it from here. And I'm going to try to be as brief as possible so that we have enough time to uh, for the action plan itself, which is the main reason for our being here. So rather than go through uh, the preamble of the communique, um, just to remind you that this communique came out the African Union Commission for Agriculture and um, Rural Development and 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 of course FARA and the CGIR. Uh, this communique was based on a few premises. Of course, Africa having the fastest the, uh, population growth, but the lowest agricultural productivity. Uh, the work of the Africa-based CG centers is critical, and for successful development and dissemination of technologies, a CGI reforms, current reforms, will take an institutional approach based on strong, fully empowered Africa-based centers. And the reform should plan to institutionally strengthen national partners. Uh, Africa is in a race against time, uh, time a race against time on food security. And the CGRR is the largest, the world's largest publicly funded ag research network, continue to play a pivotal role in the delivery of science and innovation uh, to African farmers. Now, the commitments uh, were based on key principles. And these have been translated as a set of seven principles and core values that were mutually agreed upon. And I want to share this with you because I think it's important that I remind you of what these commitments are. Number one, centers are the essential building block of one CGIR. And the reforms will build on rather than diminish their delivery capacity. Two, the roles, not thousands of farmers. Number four, the CGIR will institute and ensure a me mechanism for effectively representing Africa's priorities and research delivery, and will review the role and participation of the Global South in its governance structure. Five, the CGIR must create an institutional framework that supports and strengthens national and supranational ag research organizations. And six, CGR will formalize engagement with Africa research and innovation institutions and other CADAP associated initiatives. And after on this on this particular principle, there are four um, engagement modalities. And let me share them with you. A institutional structure through formalized engagement, B, funding by advocating for increased investment in African agricultural research and innovation systems. I believe we alluded to this in the earlier session this morning. C, strategic alignment with agricultural strategies of key African ag systems, CADAP, that FAO science, uh, FAO science strategy, et cetera, and uh, D, capacity development, including strengthening human and institutional capacities. And the seventh principle is that Africa must have its own representatives accountable to its constituents. These commitments to be agreed upon by CGIR and African research institutions so there is a challenge here, or not a challenge, there is a requirement that this action plan must be agreed upon not only by the African stakeholders, but also with the CGIR. Because the CGIR here is the main, main, main player in this particular uh, 
issue that we're talking about. Now, that is a conclusion that I'd like to share with you. It's important that we have made some progress since Abidjan 2, because the CGIR has implemented commitments number one, two, and four. Just to help you to remember, number one, centers are the essential building blocks of one CGIR. And for those who have seen IFA 4, this is fully recognized. IFA 4 or IFA 4 is the integrated, integrated or integration framework agreement. Two, the roles and composition of respective one CGI boards will be composed as set out in their governance instruments or documents. And number four, the CGIR will institute and ensure a mechanism for effective representing of Africa's priorities and research delivery, and that is very clearly demonstrated. So there is some progress, actually, a very impressive progress since uh, Abidjan II. And so this actually is demonstrated in the IFA, as I just mentioned. And version 4, I hope by the end of uh, uh, this week, uh, will be endorsed by the, uh, the, by the centers, by all the centers, and so on and so forth. So I do believe that in many ways, this communique, uh, for those of you who have had a chance to read it, and for those who have not, I will encourage you to read it. Uh, for when I was reading this over the weekend in preparation for today, I was actually impressed to the extent of the commitments and the, um, honestly, the genuineness that went into this communique uh, by all parties concerned. I see it already as a, as a, as a, as a pathway, frankly, for the CGI in Africa. It's like a roadmap. And there's a lot that we can achieve through carrying through with the, what we have uh, we have promised to do on that communicate. So with that, if you allow me, uh, let us move directly to the next uh, agenda item, which is um, the presentation of the initial draft of the Abidjan to communicate action plan by Dr. Yemi Akimbamijo. I would rather that we have that session, I mean that presentation, and then we have it open for feedback. That's the session uh, the section that follows after the presentation will then be uh, facilitated by uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, Dr. Yemi, are you with us? So I'm going to pass this over to you. Hey, Cabo. We can't hear you. We are not hearing you yet. Hello, Yanni. Can I just um, stop you a bit? Could you stop sharing your screen so that we can get the um, presentation on? If, okay. Thank you.
Yeah, you can. Can he go ahead? You can go ahead, but go ahead, Yemi. Thanks. Sorry. Yes, he's sharing. He's sharing his screen. Okay. Thank you. 
had 20 years of the program of the APRM, we had 10 years of post government, which is coming back from a number of conferences of the conference of the parties in 2007, which also happened to happen uh, in Africa. And we had eight years post Malabo, but still putting books are projected.
call to action in this action plan. Very simple. It is for us to develop a plan of action that will help us to operationalize and the spirit and the better of the Irishman program. Operationalize the spirit and the better of the Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yemi. Um, but before we move on to the feedback on, so I'll just quickly go through that, um, Yemi, just to help the participants here so that they can actually react to um, this initial draft. And I insist it's not the end of the story, it's just the initial draft. And we're expecting um, feedback, inputs. Um, we wouldn't go into any questioning for now, but just feedback, inputs that would allow us to build on it. And I just want to remind you that um, we're going to take this further in, in consultations with different categories of stakeholders in the future. And as Marco said, we want, by the time we get to 2023, the first quarter, 
where this plan would have, before the, it is endorsed, we're going to be sure that we have uh, um, maximum consultation and inputs from our stakeholders. So um, could, could you just go back on, 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 on these um, action steps, please? So um, if, if we really have followed, these action steps are responding to the commitments that were made. For example, the first major commitment was scaling up mechanisms. So um, that's one of the, the commitments. And um, the, the partners were saying that we need to scale up. And scaling up does not mean um, 10,000 farmers. We're talking about millions of farmers. So that's very key, an action step. And we have other um, um, little actions that we, we're referring to here. Technology transfer, and we mentioned TAT. Um, there's extension. We need accountability systems, efficient and effective financing mechanisms. And we even went on to, pr to, to present the, 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 the institutions that are responding with, with, the, with our partners, the African Union Commission, through a revised MOU. We already have, the CGI has already signed an, um, a memorandum of understanding with the CGIR, um, um, African Union. And we, we, we need to revise this in alignment with what we have said, all the, the, the various commitments. And also, um, we're also um, looking at responsibilities within institutional framework and guidance, oversight, um, um, <coughs> monitoring, evaluation and learning and communication. So all of these will be packaged into this particular action step. A, th a, ma a third major action step is resource mobilization for zero hunger. And here we're talking about advocacy for funding, CGI and national systems. Remember we said that we should support um, national systems, support to national systems and, and, and um, obviously through CGI and AFDB partnership um, and, and create innovative financing um, systems that will allow us to actually um, resource um, um, the, the activities that we have um, in, in, in reaching zero hunger. And again, we, we have um, institutions that we think will be responsible for these. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, another major action step is the strategy, um, as is strategic between CGIR and CADEP. And, and CADEP is a continental um, Afri um, African um, <coughs> development, um, African what is, agricultural development program. So this is actually the strategy, agricultural strategy for Africa, in other words. And um, we need to have a review um, and, um, and how we implement this strategy, CADEP um, X Pillar 4, which is a, 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 part, a platform of partners, including FARA, the National Agricultural Systems, this, this, the, the sub regional organizations, and we, we can even include the, the, the TAT, the, the, this particular mechanism that is used to scale out, and we've made mention of it in, in innovations. Uh, at present. And here um, we have um, suggested that FARA will lead all of this. A th another action step is institutional capacity, and here we've spoken about this strengthening interventions, and this would include human resources, skills, improving um, um, extension systems, because they're all part of developing the institutional capacity, capacity building and investing even in infrastructure and, and maintenance and resources for research institutions and learning. And a final action step that we came up with is the partnership and delivery models. Here we're talking about high-level independent advisory panel frameworks um, um, for, for monitoring and evaluation and, and obviously looking at planning, communication, and partnership engagement. So we have all of these elements in there. In that meeting we had for three days, we came up with these major action steps. And what we want here is for you to react to this, to, to see whether these are adequate enough or whether we need to add on um, these um, other action steps or how we could improve on this so that it's not going to end here, but we'll have 20 minutes um, and Ali will facilitate those sessions. So, um, and obviously, if you need further information as we move along um, in, in... On the screen, on the actions, please, the first slide with because I think it's good to guide the discussions to start looking at the actions themselves. Um, okay, so I think, you know, just maybe to give this some structure, uh, there is, you know, a lot of diverse, you know, experiences within this room, a combination from CG and from outside the CG. 
So I think one uh, good way to uh, structure these comments is to see, first of all, how you view the adequacy of those actions, but also if you are able to think of a particular institution or a particular initiative or a particular uh, activity or a particular intervention that the CGIR is currently doing that helps deliver on some of these actions, let's use the opportunity to map it so that let's not reinvent the wheel but build on what we have. And I think we have Roger here uh, at the end of the room who is helping us capture all of these thoughts and ideas which will then go back uh, to the working groups as they refine these, uh, you know, this action plan further. And again, there will be further opportunities for further consultation next year. So, um, there is, uh, the, we have, uh, you know, moving microphones. I think we have a couple of them. And, uh, you know, please, let's be in any particular order. Hello. Uh, <laughs> good yes. afternoon. My name's uh, Michael Victor. I'm the head of communications and knowledge management at uh, ILRI, at the International Livestock Research Institute. And this is a, it's really nice to see now having this kind of umbrella uh, framework that's coming on. And I just, you were asking for actions and uh, examples of what we can do together. We've actually already designed or co-designed up X for, P, X for P partners to develop a knowledge management partnership and framework uh, that needs now to be implemented. And I think there's some kind of core elements there uh, that are really important to really kind of uh, envision of how we can actually implement this framework, which is at a very high level. And I think one thing to include in here that's it's kind of mentioned, but it's, it's implicit, is knowledge and information. Knowledge is power, and ensuring that both sides, that everything is co-designed, that knowledge is flowing freely, that it's open and, open and accessible will be central to ensuring and unlocking that the technologies are getting out to the farmers and farmers are benefiting from this. So if we could have this kind of partnership that's always already been co-designed between the Codep X for P partners and CGIR for knowledge management, would be great and then making sure that knowledge, information, and data are really central uh, to this partnership and uh, memorandum of understanding. Thank excellent, you. excellent contribution. I like it. It's very pointed, it's concrete, it's specific. Now, one thing we have not done, uh, Roger, is maybe just to put in one email on the screen where further comments and follow options could be connected. Maybe you volunteer your own email for now. If we can have it on the screen so that people could send and share documentation and may and possibly even make very additional uh, specific proposals. Uh, Oscar, please. Thank you, um, Oscar Ortiz, uh, Interim DG of the International Potato Center. Um, I would like to refer to the first principle, scaling. Uh, there's no question that scaling uh, is the priority given the, the need, uh, the needs in Africa. Uh, the second aspect would be uh, on scaling itself. Do we have the uh, scaling mechanisms already proved, tested, to be mobilized quickly? If the answer is yes, of course, it's one direction. If the answer is no, we need to validate scaling mechanisms that can be replicated. Reaching millions of households is not an, an easy task, and, and they're not blueprints. So we need to really um, see what exists, what is tested, proved to be mobilized. And the other point, um, it's of course, uh, uh, the, the role of Africa-based centers is critical for convening, coordinating this effort, um, but representing the one CGIR, which involves um, other centers that can bring uh, resources, expertise, to respond to this uh, big challenge. And several other centers dealing with different topics have uh, strong portfolios of projects in Africa and lessons that could be used for the strategy as well. So as one CGIR, we can mobilize the, the entire globe to attend the African needs given the importance of the continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. I think, again, another very set of uh, you know, excellent comments. Uh, I think we need to clearly make sh uh, sure that within the actions there is a mechanism for bringing the wider community of the CGIR through the regional representatives into uh, the African continent. On the scaling, I think it has been emphasized that the 
program funded by the African Development Bank, the TAT, the Technology for African Agricultural Transformation, offers an excellent model that has been tested, I think, at least over the past 12, 15 years. But by, by no means this is suggested as the only model for scaling. Because I think given the diversity across the, the African continent, both in terms of environment, capacities, and needs, there is definitely scope for testing further some of the other scaling options. And last, I think I, I personally agree that the need for continuous uh, improvement of ex existing technologies. The end is not where we are today, but I think there is need for a balanced approach between the two. Thank you for making these comments. Please. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I'm Ian Wright, DDG for Integrated Sciences at Ilri here in Nairobi. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's great that we've got, got this far and have the signatories to the Abidjan uh, to uh, communicate in, 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 in place. Uh, but I think that as we implement this plan, we need to think who else needs to be at the table because if we're going to achieve the ambition that we've set from this communique, there are many other players in the landscape other than those that signed the communique. Oscar mentioned scaling. To get to scale, we will need other investors. We will critically need the private sector. Without private sector engagement, we will not achieve this, this vision. So as the plan is developed, I think more thought needs to be given as who are the other partners that we need to engage with in order to deliver on this, in this plan. Uh, excellent uh, comment, Nian. And I think one thing, one uh, mistake that we do un unconsciously, we speak about that, we think everybody knows how the scaling process and what are the innovations and how are we engaging all the stakeholders. Because I think in the case of that, if you're talking about the wheat or any of the other compacts, you bring in all, you start all the way from the farmer all the way up to the minister. So the private operators are there, government institutions, extension workers, the seed companies, uh, the agro dealers, everyone along the value chain. And I think going forward, if you want to really reach our leader animal and human health program at INRI here in Nairobi. Um, I, I have uh, two comments uh, linked to that. Uh, listening uh, our discussions this morning and the framework we are having here, I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking of two things. So I have the feeling that, of course, you know, this uh, communique is between FARA and, and CGA and more African, which African partners. But we don't forget that CG, we, we are working at global level. So the first point I want to, to, to make is about South-South partnership. What is the role of CGA really to facilitate the South-South partnership or learning between Africa and other continent? I'm from Southeast Asia. I have been there for seven or eight years before moving to Nairobi. And for the CRP, uh, livestock CRP, we set up the system to study the live, uh, livestock value chain between Vietnam and Uganda, specifically on, on pigs. Vietnam, they are very good in rice pr pr uh, production, but also raising pigs, for example. So what would be the learning for Uganda and some other country uh, with uh, emerging or you know, uh, developing uh, pork consumption and demand, for example? So some of the technology uh, to scan we are talking about is not necessarily uh, uh, invented by our CGIR, but by other NAS system in Vietnam, for example. So we can also make use of that for other country. And I think that CGIR can, can show our advantage by uh, uh, doing things in different countries. So we know partner, we know people, so we link uh, things better to, uh, to together for, for Africa. So that's the first comment. The second comment, and this is actually, I look at our EPRIDG uh, this morning because we talked about financing agriculture. And, and I think that you know, uh, for low and middle income countries, the tendency for some of the, uh, for this investment of the country in agriculture sectors. You know, I, I was sitting with him uh, for the last two days and he already talked about the interface between uh, how scientific evidence can uh, be uh, uh, used for policy and transformation and this kind of thing. And I think that is, that is very important point that we need to really stimulating more investment from the country themselves to really transform the food system we are talking about in African context that equally apply for Asian or, or any other country. Thank you very much. And I can relate very much to the point on uh, financing. You know, in my previous life before coming to the CGIR, I was with the African Development Bank and we did a study of the total financial flows into the agriculture sector by all the donor community. And it was less than 2% compared to 98% investment by the African government themselves in their own economy. So I think we just need to make sure that the policy makers, the finance ministers, come together with the Minister of Agriculture and understand the importance of challenging and making appropriate 
uh, you know, allocations in, within the context of the budget process. I think we have one speaker on this side, and then I'll come to you because you have asked for the floor. Uh, Dr. Namanga. Thank you very much, Ali. The last speaker actually spoke, almost spoke my mind. Because I said, when Marco spoke this morning, he said, CG has strengthened capacity in Asia and Latin America, but more or less substituted capacity in Africa. When Yemi was speaking, he gave a long list of how many years of this and how many years of that commitment and the next commitment and the rest. Clearly, it is the lack of the either political will and capacity of the African countries themselves to be able to finance the critical part of the investments that are needed for the national research and the, the uh, development, uh, uh, research for development systems. If they do, then the rest of what we are doing here will be supportive of that process and they will be able to move forward. If I use my own country as an example, I'm from Cameroon. The, uh, the budget being discussed now is about $10 billion a year. The CADAP says 10% of national budgets to agriculture. Can you envisage Cameroon using $1, $1 billion in agriculture? Not really. But we don't even come close to $100 million. So that, that's, that's really the, 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 the problem. In that the, we should find ways of engaging with the national government to be able to encourage them to live up to the commitments that they have made to finance their own systems. If we, if we can succeed in that, most of the partnerships we are talking about, uh, private sector and CGIR, or what are scaling up, uh, delivery, has a, get, a better chance of succeeding. So uh, thank you all for the last speaker. I forgot uh, his name, uh, but uh, that was good uh, to, to introduce that uh, concept. Th thank you very much, Chair. My name is Namkolo Kovic. Um, uh, I'm Ilri's Director General's representative to Ethiopia and also Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa for the 1CG. Um, I stand up to respond to one of your questions, which was, are there some things that uh, perhaps the CGIR has already been doing that we could uh, leverage and perhaps things that have emerged in recent weeks I think one of, uh, with respect to CADEP itself, the first one would be the regional strategic uh, knowledge support system that was initially hosted by IFPRI and is now at Academia 2063, but still has a lot of CGIR staff from different centers that are associated with it. Um, it involves, um, a lot of monitoring of the CADEP process at country level, at regional level, as well as at continental level. It offers an opportunity for the CGIR to complement what countries are doing and bring uh, CGIR's comparative advantage into learning lessons from activities of CADEP towards the scaling up that we are now discussing. The second, again, within CADEP is um, last week at the CADEP PP, uh, we had a consultation uh, looking at CAD, uh, CGIR country conveners and their CADEP focal points at country level to look at how we can forge stronger relationships. And there, again, uh, some of the issues that came up are issues around the fact that for many countries where the CGIR has been in place, um, there's a lot of evidence that has already been generated that the countries appear again was the fact that the African Union Commission is now talking about revamping the seven, um, uh, the seven technical networks of the CADEP process and they identified that CGIR could actually be helpful there. And through those technical capacity networks then to again accelerate uh, progress on some of these institutional capacities that we are talking about. Then the final one that I want to speak about, I have my colleague over there, uh, Swanisa Moyo. 
there was a recent workshop, uh, I think two weeks ago, on access benefit sharing of genetic resources that specifically uh, referred to the gene banks that the, um, that the, the CGIR have. And this also then filtered into the CADAP PP to indicate that um, African countries can benefit uh, better from the gene banks that the CGIR is, um, I guess, is it's more hosting on behalf of the planet, if you will, um, and to really have those genetic resources are required for us to be able to build on um, resilience from animal breeds, crop breeds, as we face this climate crisis. And the African Union specifically requested that the CGIR find ways we can support so that they can, uh, as we are speaking here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I like very much the point. Uh, they're all good points, but the points on the gene banks, I think within the context of capacity development, there is a very important effort needed to scale up the capacity building across all national research institutes so that they know what to ask, what capabilities are there, what services are there, and what is the full potential of what is available, not just within the Africa-based uh, centers, but more globally across the CGIR. So thank you for making these comments. Please. Good afternoon. Um, Abdullah Jalo, I'm the Director of Research and Innovation at Africa RISE. Um, Marco made an observation that um, the national systems in Asia have moved, and uh, apparently Africa is just a fact. And um, I will say it's therefore no surprise that Africa is taking this kind of proactive step to really engage uh, the one CGIAR. And I think this is a commendable um, effort and step in that direction. The second point is, I am aware of the fact that uh, a center like Africa Rise has already modeled its new strategic plan alongside that of the one CGIAR. I think these are all positive steps that Africa is really ready to collaborate and move within the framework of one CGIAR. Well, like my colleague said there, is there room for a South-South uh, collaboration? I want to ask, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm resisting to intervene because I'm only moderating here. But on this very specific point, I was actually uh, in India last week, and I, I was meeting with the gentleman who was speaking uh, on the panel this morning. India produces 110 million tons of wheat. They feed 1.4 billion people, and they still export wheat to the rest of the world. So there must be something to learn from this experience. Very similarly, huge successes in many other areas, and I think I would very much emphasize the South-South collaboration. Let's find creative ways on how we can link up Africa, leverage these South-South opportunities in a much uh, more, uh, in a much better way. Please, madam. Thank you. My name is Florence Wambogo. I'm the CEO of Africa Harvest, an international non-for-profit working on the technology delivery, focusing on impact, unleashing uh, thousands of farmers and all that across Africa, but many in the country. We have worked on all kinds of value chains. Um, I'm, I'm new to this. I joined Africa Rice as in the board. That's why I'm here. And I'm really excited to hear this focus, proactive on impact, and that's really good. I was before involved in the board of IPFGRI, before they became biodiversity, and I was also involved in a bit of change the CG efforts that didn't materialize. I'm very excited to find it coming together. Thank you very much. So my, my comment about this, because I'm dealing with truly the deliver, the last mile delivery. In this engagement, the little I know about the Green Revolution, you know more than I do, but what I do, there was engagement with the government. It is the government of India's scientists, 
like you have in CGI, that time was Mexico, I believe, um, uh, which center in Mexico, CIMIT, engaging with the government, government putting policy in place, government investing in irrigation, government irrigating information, government investing in the training. Uh, the scientists brought the science, the technology, maybe not even money, I don't know if they put money there. But the government saw a demanded, there was a government pool. The government became part of the solution. That means, like now, let me just say an example. Kenya is in a serious problem of importing rice. We're importing 85% of the rice we need in this country. So we went to the government and said, we have a solution to help you reduce your rice import bill, which is 200 billion Kenya shillings. How can we help you? They are so ready to listen. Because they are already sending money away. And I can tell that. So I'm looking at this from food import bill, engaging the government, answering the, helping the governments in the area of need, so that instead of pushing them, put 10%, we are saying you're already spending so much. How can we help you? And you now you have experience from TAT. How can we help you solve your problems? And so you have a serious meeting point, and this, whether they are the ones going to the Africa Development Bank to take a loan or to IFAD or whatever, then you have a meeting point. Thank you very much. I'm Ambassador Idro from Africa Rice. I'm not a scientist, but I enjoy scientific products. Uh, we have more money in Africa than we need. That's a fact. I know you scientists have You may not know how much we use, even in terms of perfumes and in terms of beauty products. In Uganda, we export coffee worth $800 million, but the beauty products we import is $1.8 billion. That's a fact. So where is that coming from? So we have this money, and I don't want you to be confused about it because even if you go to the banks today, they will tell you that the governments borrow money from internal revenues or from uh, what you call internal deposits. This is local people's money. So don't, don't, don't be deceived. And, and the narrative that we must always receive money from foreigners is such that now we are used to it. And so they think that's the only stream from where we can get money. And I think that's where the, the major problem is. So we need to change that narrative. We even need to change the information. Because you need to go into the banks to see where the monies are. Because if you look in terms of investments, even with the farmers, Nairobi has about three, Kenya has three million cars. How many tractors do they have? Because the cost of a tractor is the same as a car. So if we had 3 million tractors in Kenya and 2 million tractors in Uganda, would we be talking this language? But the preferred thinking is we buy cars, not tractors. And these cars are also almost the cost of a factory. And the houses you have built all over, which calls Nairobi or Kampala or Ivory Coast, Abidjan, is the same with which you can build a factory. But we prefer to invest in another form. I think that is the point. Because until we see this, we'll still want a house, you want a car, and then you pay for it in cash, then you want a tractor on credit, and you are not financing the researcher. That's exactly the problem. And until we are clear about these things, I am sorry, you scientists will remain broke, because you'll be begging for money. And for us also, we'll be broke because we shall be working inefficiently on old technologies and old knowledge. And until we all, and they will not give you. And they will keep on buying a Land Rover, uh, what you call it, a Land Cruiser, a Mercedes, and all these, and things which are much bigger than your laboratory equipment. But you'll remain broke because you have not communicated his benefits. 
So I think, I think to me, we need to, to realize what uh, the communication scheme should be so that we can do it. Now, number two, we have a problem. I'm really, uh, I need help. Because we say we need more food. But according to FAO, we're already producing enough food for 10 billion people. Now, wh what do you need more food production for? If you already have a problem, and according to the minister in India, the problem is wastage. Who is going to eat this? India, which was very broke and had no food, is exporting wheat and rice. What are you going to export to who? It is the same to China. And you will not export to the U.S. except specialized things because they already have enough food. So I think if this food is an African problem, the calories, let's agree that that is the issue and that's the target. But let's not uh, go, go wrong into producing things that will not be needed. For instance, China needs food, yes, but higher quality meat. India needs higher quality purses. But we are researching for Africa to export to America. I think there is a problem. We need to revisit this, but we shall talk more. There are many issues, I think, within ourselves that we need to put right. <laughs> I just wanted, I thought I could get that, that, thank, that correct. Thank you very uh, thank much you for very a much. very excellent uh, set of reflections in you know, making the case for more effective resource allocation among African countries. I think we can take these two more comments, and I think at some point in time we'll have to bring this to close. The last two comments, please. Start with me. Yes, please. If you I would just, identify yourself and then yes, proceed. Yes, I just uh, I just want to say very quickly. My name is Masen Waloze from Africa Life. I just want to say. Microphone. Yeah, looking at the list, um, I don't see. It seems to me that um, we forget that there are other partners that the national, the countries are also partnering with. Because here we're talking about partnerships. There are advanced research institutes from the north. And I think they should be, they should be part of the equation somehow. We shouldn't forget that because they are also having partnerships with the various countries at different levels. And I think we should put that in perspective as we plan to go ahead with our partnerships with the countries. Thank you very much. The last comment, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Karugia. I'm a scientist, agricultural economist at EURI, and also CGIR country convener for Kenya. And um, I'm, I'm going to take the perspective of the country. And, and we have been talking about partnerships, and I didn't get a sense that we are seeing it from the perspective of the country. Uh, Ambassador talked about too much money in the countries. I think countries have too many partnerships, and some of them probably distract the objectives of this partnership. Who needs to be at the table? Who doesn't need to be at the table, right? To deliver on a very clear uh, set of objectives, of priorities, and not getting distracted. Today we have CGIR, tomorrow a different partner, and another partner coming. They spend all the time managing partnerships, not actually doing the work that they should be doing. Thank you. Excellent uh, point, actually, to uh, close with. And I think many countries are now actually undergoing reviews of existing partnerships and uh, you know, organizations operating on the ground. And actually, CGIR centers themselves are now being receiving very difficult questions from countries across the continent where they operate, countries demanding accountability. What did we produce? What, uh, you know, how are we benefiting from your work? How are you using our financial contributions? And also, they need to justify to their own parliaments what are the privileges and immunities that are extended to CGIR centers across the board. We need to be very uh, you know, uh, conscious about the need to become also accountable and help a country on these uh, points. So this has been an extremely rich set of contributions and suggestions, which we will fully take on board as we refine the document further. I want to thank you again for the very rich contribution, and I hand back the microphone to Harold. Harold. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ali. Um, it wasn't an easy task. Ali just 
came in and I said, well, we're missing a facilitator, so um, as you have the role of a regional director in, in Africa, you, you have to play that role. And everybody was saying, that's the best man. And, and it's quite obvious that um, he's done that with ease. He has the experience. And um, I would like to thank you very much for your contribution. Um, we have listened to the, um, to the we've, we've had very interesting comments and which would help us improve on these various action steps. But there are two which I think we still need to work on. And I, I don't know why, maybe there must be reasons for that or people don't want to talk about it. Or they think that it's already done. And I note that um, there was less discussions on the strategy, the strategic issues. Maybe it's done. I don't know, but we need to delve into that. And this is strategy aligning all these different strategies that we have. It's important because that's the starting point. And then the governance issues as well. How we actually um, set up a framework that would look at you know, the, the way we, we operate as a group, which, because now we, are, we have um, very important partners that have committed themselves to this action plan, um, and we need to actually look at the institutional and governance mechanisms around this. It's very important. But again, as I said, um, thank you very much. We've had great inputs. Um, I re echo the thanks of, 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 of Ali, and um, it's not the end of the road. This is just the beginning. It's the initial document, the first. And um, we're going to organize ourselves in the best way possible so that we can have further consultations with different categories of stakeholders. You know, um, the CGI has always been blamed for not consulting. We have a way of consulting. Maybe we're up there and we think it's happening. We're going to change the tune. So we're going to go right down to the different categories of stakeholders for the presentation, he actually worked on this document, and um, we agree that it's an initial, um, um, it's an in initial draft, and we're going to continue work on it. And I would also like to thank um, the 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 um, chair of the board of Farah, who gave actually framed the discussions. We lost our moderator on the way, but he has to. He's just been um, appointed the new board chair of Africa Rise, so he has to be in that meeting, so he had to leave us. Um, so um, once more, thanks very much, and I hope that we'll continue this conversation. It's not the end, and I'll leave it at there. Thank you very much.